Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode, is it four or five? I forgot to count. <laughs> <laughs> four, it says four I'm over pretty there. sure it's episode four. <laughs> Who cares? Today's guest is none other than creative business coach, creative holistic business coach from Reality Check, Bo Kitty. Hi, everyone. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Um, Bo, you are one of those individuals who I have come to, like, I, th there's some individuals that exist in our music and festival scene that I have to sort of build a bit of a, like, a, a bio about them so I know sort of who they are because I'm like, I hear through the grapevine of all this amazing body of work they've done and how how many, um, how involved they are into the scene. And you are one of those individuals from, from what I've understood and from mm -hmm. what people have told me and it's one of the many reasons uh and there are more reasons that we're gonna you know talk about but one of the many reasons why i wanted you to be a guest on my show one of them obviously being that you are also a business coach to dan who was the previous guest mm -hmm. and uh from your website i saw you were a business coach or i don't know music uh, i don't know what would you describe it like a, a music coach a creative coach i'm not a music coach but i help people with their their, their business side of their creative pursuits, basically. So I am a holistic business coach, but I've spent 20 years in music, arts, and that sort of creative sphere, mainly in Melbourne. So mm. that's who most of my clients are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you had Ganga, Ganga Geary, a very good friend of mine. Very old friend of mine from Adelaide, actually. Yeah. We've known each other 20 years. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's surprising that I was like, I saw him and I'm like, wow, I mean, I feel like Ganga's got his shit so dialed in. Oh, uh, he does. He does. He's very successful at what he does. But even the most successful people need often need uh, outside help or a sounding board, mm. especially when they're trying to do something new. Yeah. And and that was part of why Gunga and I were talking is that uh, – and the other thing is some, some people who have been so dialed in for ages like Gunga, um, they don't use their network to their advantage as in social media. Mm. So some of the work that Gunga and I were doing was just about that, like how to sort of really tap into that network and use it a bit better, yeah. you know. Um, but he also does sort of cultural incursions with this uh, business that he has called Didgeridoo Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, where they go in and, and go into schools and sometimes take Indigenous singers and dancers. And so he was sort of also looking for, I mean, he's made it in the music industry internationally. Mm. Yeah. But then he was looking like, how do I now package what I'm doing for schools? So we did some of that work together. Yeah. So, yeah, even the most um, very famous people do still need outside help to reassess and re-strategize what they're doing, you know. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. It's like um, you need new tricks in the book and you new – you, like you said, new strategies. Just fresh eyes sometimes. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people, like I think Dan said in the podcast, which I really liked, he was like, it's really helpful to just have a sounding board. Like he does just hit me up and go, what do you think of this? And I'm like, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have a really good friendship where I can just say that to him without yeah, worrying yeah. about damaging his ego too much because yeah, we yeah. have a friendship, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, whenever I tear one of Dan's ideas down, I give him a better alternative, um, mm. which is what, reality checks all about it's not about just telling someone that's got no legs it's about well how do we actually give it legs yeah you know? yeah it's so interesting that you say that i grew up in like my, my parents and my both my mother and father and my brother or well, my older brother they're so hypercritical right mm -hmm. so they were this, we're so quick to just shoot down each other's ideas but it's like but we never actually offer something else. That's the it's problem. Always, you know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm, it's really crippled me in some yes. ways my whole life. And I'm like, I've been just trying to break out of that mold. Yes. And it's, it's uh, first off, it's really nice to hear that, you know, mm. uh, if you're going to criticize something, then offer a better alternative. Absolutely. And, I, and honestly, that comes from a childhood very similar. I just got torn down a lot in my childhood. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think it's almost a little bit of a reaction to that. Like if you're going to, to be critical, like, cause I do, I, I was heavily criticized throughout my childhood. Um, by, by your parents or yeah. just like peers or? No, no, by my parents. Yeah. Um, for other reasons that we touched on earlier before the podcast, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's made me, um, fierce in the way that I support people. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I actually want to build them up. I'm not here to tear people down. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. kind of like this, um, you just don't like bullies. No. In, in, in a way, right? No, I've got no time for bullies. Yeah, and if you're yeah. going to be a bully, go over there until you come back with something constructive. 
<laughs> Seriously. You yeah, know? And the yeah. same thing happens on festival sites. Oh, as all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People just like, oh, fucking mace with fucking. My, my main uh, motto in operations is don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Yeah. Like yeah. I will help you with your problems, but also if you've thought about the best solution, you probably know more about that solution than I do and I can then help you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know what it's like when you're in the office and someone comes in and it's like, Something needs like lifting. We need this kind of machinery and I can't do it like this unless this is like, okay. okay. That, that's an easy one. The sort of curly four paragraph personal stuff is the tricky problems <laughs> that I usually have to deal with. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's it's much... Um, machinery is easy. <laughs> machinery is easy, but I, I know what you mean when people come in and it's like this person's like dealing with this and on-site drama. You've been yes. there for three weeks and, and it's like... yeah. All right, let's turn on the Dr. Phil hat. And, put the and Dr. I do, Phil hat and on. I do. You know, I sit people down and, and calm them down and we find sometimes we don't actually resolve the problem with that other person. Sometimes yeah. it's me resolving where that person is at with the problem. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's coaching as well, you yeah. know. Um, it's about empathy and, and, um, and compassion without sort of enabling people bullshit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. How how do you feel though that that does that ever get to you, like especially in a in a job environment? I mean, surely that would just keep adding stress, right? If you just have to, um, like, do you have an avenue to <laughs> on site? Or? Um, look, I actually really thrive in chaotic environments. I love that kind of stress. Mm. Um, I also really like being in a position where when we resolve the thing. For me, it's resolved and it's gone and yeah. it's out of the filing cabinet of my mind and I have room for other problems. Yeah. yeah so yeah. there's actually something really um, sort of, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but it's kind of very, there's a feeling of accomplishment every time there's a pro problem solved and then it's on to the next thing, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's actually a lot of gratification for me in that high-stress environment. Yeah, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah. This is all about like, the, the little wins. Yeah, know? I mean, I wouldn't keep going back after all these years to that sort of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, get, I guess, like, you have to, like, appreciate that and have gratitude because for the most part you're sitting in an office where it's like people don't know that if it wasn't for you, like all these chains would start to fall apart. You know what I mean? Or, like yeah, no, my, ne my name's never on the poster. <laughs> no, and, and, and uh, look, it's it's one of the reasons also why you're here today. today, mm. um, Because I've, I've been in that position and I've had have, have friends who are in that, you know, we work in the same, in operations. I've got a really good friend of mine, Katina, um, boss woman. Love her. Yeah. yeah, I love her to death. You, you have similar personalities. We do. It? We get along well, me and Kat. Yeah, yeah. Can, but we're, I, we're very different, but we're also, there's a lot of crossover in how we yeah. roll, especially on site. Yeah. 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 And um, uh, I don't get to see Kat or talk to her as much as I do, but every time I see her, it's like, I love you. Yeah, same. And it's like, yeah, yeah. I love you too. Yeah. Like, to, you know, yeah. to death. Um, but one of the things that makes, you know, the two of you so good is that how, Again, you're very direct, you're very assertive, um, and there's no bullshit. You know, you just cut through and mm. this is what needs to be done. And if you don't like it, you can kindly fuck off. Look, most people appreciate that in that situation. Mm. Uh, I will say that that attitude, I have had to temper that in other environments. <laughs> like, for example, that may roll on a festival site of, of doof people. Not in a relationship? But, uh <laughs> I don't, I'm actually not like that in my personal relationship, like yeah. in my close personal relationships. But I just sort of mean when you go and work a community event where the average demographic is normies. <laughs> normies. Normal people. Normal, norm normal, normies. Normal. normies. Um, okay. you, you definitely have to temper that sort of uh, – you have to be a bit more – Subtle or, or yeah, ta tactful. Tactful is the right word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which um, I, I attempt to do. <laughs> How hard is it? <laughs> it's a little hard sometimes. Because you're restricting your, your, you know, your nature. Or your... Especially because some of those events are just really over-engineered in some pointless aspects and totally under-engineered in others. Yeah. And so you walk in and it's just literally a bun fight and you're like, how have you people done this event for 15 years like this? Yeah. It's a bit different. I mean, music festivals are very um, – they evolve quickly. Like each year evolves a lot. Mm -hmm. Community events don't really have that they don't grow and change as much why do you think that is, is that... um i think that what we do in the music industry is um very ephemeral ephemeral and um 
you know, anyone who was going to some of the parties 10 years ago will attest to the fact of how different they are 10 years later. Mm, and yeah, even yeah. if they book the same lineup all the time, the, the crowd is different, the vibe is different, the, the, the party itself grows. And um, I think there's an opportunity there to, to do it better every time. Yeah. Whereas in community events, you know, no one looks at it for eight months of the year and then everybody quickly comes on board and rolls out the same paperwork with a different date on it. And yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean? It's, yeah, not, yeah, it's yeah. not sort of a totally fresh new event every year. The irony in that is that it doesn't feel like a community <laughs> set up for the fact that it is a community, you know what I mean? Sometimes, yeah. It um, depends where I've worked on a whole range of them. And I mean, I even worked at the National Folk Festival in Canberra, which has been running for like 50 or 60 years. And they were just so many levels of, of ingrained complacency. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was like they, they they needed a complete redo for Overhaul, me. yeah. Absolutely, you yeah. know, and it wasn't anybody's fault that it was like that. It had just gradually become the same, the same, the same, mm. you know. Um, whereas every single year when we go to the same doof, it's a totally different event. Yeah, you know? yeah, mm. absolutely. I loved seeing that evolution, especially for, for some of the new festivals on the block, you know. Um, mm. You see the production level. Uh, yes. increase and then not just the production level for me it's the little things like uh, I remember when I started to get booked um, across the borders to like New South Wales I went to uh, one of the first like uh, New South Wales festivals was like Tribal Gathering mm -hmm. and uh, Lucid Lab which was which was essentially an illegal doof but it was ran like a legal doof you yes. know with like almost 2,000 people and it was run by Katina had a, a big part in it, in it. Um, Dylan Blackwaddle, I don't know, Blackwaddle Design. He he does a lot of the decor for Dragon Dreaming. And, uh, yep. and you know, they had help as well from the Regen guys and, and yep. the Dragon Dreaming guys because they're all, you know, Canberra, New South Wales, very connected. And, mm. and I think, I'm sure you know. Um, but so many things from the, you know, the artists, like we had, you know, tents, we had food tokens. We didn't even ask for some of this stuff, mm. you know. Uh, just little things that made me feel more comfortable as an as an artist but then also as a punter i was like they've got the sound dialed in right they've mm. put so much attention to you know from a production point of view even the lighting had little plastic tubs on top of them you know for rain, rain yeah. you know some people don't do that and you're just like yep you know hazard 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 mm. hazard um and so yeah and they evolved uh, obviously over time and you know they got heavily involved with dragon dreaming in their stages mm. and again you could just see the production value every yep. year escalate and it's um, it's really exciting. Mm. Now, for you, what I wanted to know is obviously, <coughs> sorry, is you've been in the in the scene for a very long time. I I want to know how it started for you from being a punter to suddenly being this person who steps in in this sort of complacent environment, like like the um, mm. is it the Canberra uh, folk festival, folk festival mm. and go you know do you go in there and go. We're changing this, we're changing this, we're changing mm. this, you know? Like, how did you, where did that start for you? Mm. Um, <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's funny when you put it like that because, like, it, from from someone meeting me now, it seems like suddenly you were this and then you were that. But actually it was a really long, really organic process. Mm, and that's, it, that's what I want to yeah, know. Yeah, and it wasn't actually intentional. I mean, I didn't sort of go to my first rave and go, oh, my God, I'm going to run this shit. Like, it totally yeah. didn't go yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I grew up uh, in San Francisco and then Adelaide. And so I was in Adelaide when I finished high school. Okay. Um, and I went to my first sort of doofs in Adelaide. And at the time, there was um, some people doing some really weird underground shit. Like there was the the techno sort of crew doing club stuff mm -hmm. and doing parties. But then there was this really weird underground fluoro. And they'd been overseas to the UK and brought some of that back to Adelaide. And they would go into warehouses and totally um, make it an interactive space and all of that. And mm -hmm. that was some of the first parties I ever went to. And I was like, what is this? Like, yeah, I grew up. You know, in high school, I was listening to Beck and um, Nirvana and uh, Rage Against the Machine and um, House of Pain and, you know, mm. this mix of hip hop and, and, and sort of metal. Uh, grunt, well, grunge more, more sort of grunge yeah, than, yeah. than metal even, you know. And, um, and then I found this sort of electronic music scene and it was just, <laughs> I wasn't even really sure if I loved the music, but I loved the people. You and loved I the culture loved as well. the culture. And it's funny to this day, like I work a lot of trans parties. I actually don't. 
trance. Um, I love broken beats, which is why I love um, the snake pit stage at Esoteric because yeah. it's all this broken beat music that I love yeah. and I very rarely get to see in an outdoor environment. Um, so anyway, I um, moved to Melbourne when I was 18. I had 300 bucks in my pocket and I just was like, i got to get out of here. I, I can't stay in Adelaide. And when I got to Melbourne, I moved in with a friend of mine who moved from Adelaide as well. And at 18 years old, I started going to teriyaki and akisaki. What, what is that? Oh, that sounds so <laughs> teriyaki, a twister. Yeah, teriyaki and akisaki. So teriyaki was an um, underground techno club um, that was absolutely infamous for the fact that it mixed performance with music, with an amazing chill zone, with interaction and all of this kind of stuff. And some of those teriyaki DJs really brought a new sound to Melbourne at the time. Mm. And it was the same DJ, you, you know them, it was Simon Sleeker and it was Slack and mm. Dee. They were the three who were sort of the teriyaki DJs. Yeah. And um, uh, Simon Sleeker went on to do Semi-Retired at Rainbow with Heath Myers and Brian Miyagi. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of still in the scene and whatever, but... <laughs> They were all probably uh, five to ten years older than me. And here's me, this little bright-eyed, bushy-tailed Adelaide girl going, this is awesome. <laughs> and some of the first club nights I went to, one of them was out at the Red Room in Thornbury. I don't know if you know that venue. I've heard of it. I've heard of it. It's a dive. <laughs> it's a really dingy <laughs> venue. And I remember waiting on High Street to get into this club at two in the morning and looking up and down High Street and going, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Because back then, Thornby was the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all lived in inner city Melbourne, like Clifton Hill sort of area, you know. Um, so so teriyaki is where I sort of found a bit of a community here in Melbourne. And then due to relationship things, I moved back to Adelaide briefly. Mm. And I ended up running an underground techno club in the goth club there. <laughs> so there was a goth club. In off Hindley Street called the Priscinium with this weird ass vampire guy who thought he was a vampire who ran it. <laughs> and he was like, a legit, legit. He was dog. actually a really famous lawyer. His name was Enzo or something. <laughs> but he was, he looked like a vampire and he used to like hold court at his at his goth club nights with all these like waif women all over him and stuff. <laughs> and I went to him and I was like, Will you give me your basement on Thursday nights to run a techno night when the club was closed? Mm. So every Thursday night I would run this techno thing and the the policy back then this is 1999 the policy was vinyl only okay yeah. so we didn't even no one even knew what a cdj was then yeah. it was vinyl only or get the fuck out was it know? like a choice of yours that you wanted like that or is it just um it was a choice it was a choice back then to sort of stay close to our vinyl roots or whatever even though i wasn't playing so we'd have live techno and live techno bands and some bands from melbourne would come and tour there like I don't know if you, this is all a long time ago, 20 years ago, but Ops and Go Math. Go into it, please. Okay, yeah. so Ops and Math was a live uh, electronic music band and they played drums and it was all electronic and they were just three spunky guys with really high energy, really good musos, and it was something that we hadn't really sort of really seen. So anyway, I ran that club for a year every single week and then I realised that I needed to get back to Melbourne um, and do stuff. And so I moved back to Melbourne. I was probably 19 or nearly 20. No, I was 20 by then. And, um, yeah, reconnected with the teriyaki guys who I'm not sure if teriyaki was still going by t 2000. Um, and then went to the Millennium Earth Corps at 2000. And Which I hear, like, is that the crater one? That? No, that was years later. The Millennium Earth Corps was at Lake Eildon. Mm -hmm. and they Beautiful place. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And they invited 10 crews from different states to bring sound systems. And we were one of them. So mm. I bundled up everybody from the club, which was called the Sand Pit. And we created a water themed, we actually took a 15 meter long water fountain from Adelaide and we get there and I was like, right, let's do this. And all the guys nudge each other and one of them steps forward and he goes, Bo, are we actually going to do this? And I was like, yeah, get your drill. Like we're doing it now. And so we ran a stage at the Millennium Earth Corps and I mean, honestly, running, bringing a stage of misfits from Adelaide across the state to run a thing at the Millennium, like that was you know, another chapter of beginning. Yeah. Um, I ended up being a stage manager on and off for Earthcore over the years and was stage managing when Tism played at the circus tent a few years later and stuff like that. And I guess that's just kind of how things evolved is like I just kept putting up my hand for things. Mm. And so I did decor for Rainbow. I did um, decor for um, Cryle Castle parties yeah. for yeah. Um, f the future music 
way back in the day, like, you know, just... When they were underground as yeah, well. Yeah, well, you, sort you, of. You, you, <laughs> I mean, they were always on the more commercial tip. They were? Because I, I came in, like, again, mid, mid-story, mid you know? Yeah. No, look, they... I, the, the, the raves that happened at Cryo Castle were of the commercial thing. And that was just, like, the fashion and the music more than anything else. Mm. Um... But yeah, sort of started off doing decor. I ended up making jewelry, fluoro jewelry for Dangerfield. Like I just had a bunch of pursuits going on, and yeah. and then it wasn't really till um, two thousand and six when I got the job booking for Lounge on Swanston Street. Then I spent you know nearly a decade booking clubs, and that's when I knew every act in town and was very heavily involved in that club scene thing. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and then left the club scene and then moved back to festivals, which is kind of where I've been ever since and kind of how we met as well. Is yeah, yeah. Running safety and operations at, at events, yeah. So it's very organic and just honestly I said yes to everything I did. <laughs> yeah. At, at I mean, in the earlier stages, uh, were you getting paid to do some of this stuff or were you just like <laughs> completely like nah. I'm just going to go all in? No, nah, I didn't know. get paid for the first 10 years in the scene, honestly. Yeah. Nah. I didn't get paid for at least 10 years, which is why it got to a point a few years ago, especially when I started coaching other people, where I was like, I can't keep doing this shit for free or for almost free. Like yeah. I actually need to, if I'm going to completely give all of my resources and time and energy and emotional whatever, I need to come away not out of pocket. Yeah, you've got to figure out a way to monetize it. Well, at least to get your ass covered. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, uh, that's what I mean. I mean, when yeah. I say monetize it, because it's, yeah. it's the same... Um, uh, I, w- I was pretty much on a very similar trajectory as, as yourself. Um, and, like I was studying in university. I hated it, but I was, you know, putting all my time and effort into into the scene. Mm. And, you know, I was getting paid for for DJ gigs, but what are you, you know, what are you going to survive off a hundred bucks an hour for? There's you know, not enough DJ gigs in the world. You know, yeah, there's yeah. Not, and, and I was, you know, I was hungry. I was like, you know, pursuing it really hard and still making a little bit of money, but all this, you know, putting your hands up for the festival kind of work only started to pay off after at least, you know, five years or right. at least until, you know, I got a chance to manage a stage um, mm. and do all the bookings for that. But even then you're getting paid a finite amount of money for seven a project month- fee. Yeah. Project fee for nine months work for nine months of work. <laughs> it's like, yep. this is the shittiest deal. Yep. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I sort of switched, like sort yep. of switched things. Cause I just couldn't, you know, for a yep. while you get burnt out. Yep. Um, have you avoided that? I mean, like, because because they would have been a, a, not a crux, but a, a, a pivoting point for you that you would have, like, shifted. Mm. I have burnt out a few times, actually. Mm. And it's not actually because I haven't been paid. I think it's because I, I care a lot, actually. And I've never been doing this for th- my name up in lights or I would have been a DJ. So <laughs> I do it for other reasons, that's all. I'm, I'm not actually... I recognized this in myself recently where I realized that I, fame, the word fame has never been my goal, but I do actually want recognition. Mm. And, and there's a difference. They're very different, you know, and at the end of the day, that proving yourself for five years dynamic, that's okay when you're 20-something and you're starting out. But once you hit 35 and you've been doing it 15 years and you get invited on board a new event, you shouldn't need to prove yourself for five years to them. Yeah, And it still happens in this industry where it's like, yeah, we've heard you, you've done a million things and we've heard a million good things about you, but still need to prove yourself for a couple of years till we're going to actually pay you correctly or respect you correctly. And I just won't do that anymore. Yeah, It's like, here's my website. You can t- talk to any of these promoters about what I've done for them. And yeah. then you either want me or you don't. And I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sort of bend over backwards yeah. uh, to work yeah. for people anymore. It, it's been a hard thing, isn't it? Is because our scene, it's not, again, the more the bush do, like festival side of scene, it's not a mainstream or commercial st- like thing. And, and we don't live in a country like, or, or a continent like Europe, Europe, where, you know, they've just, they've been doing it for so long that people just get paid second nature. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You, yeah, yeah, that's your work. You're running a tour for so and so, like some techno agency or something mm. like that. You know, people get paid, sure. Yeah. There's set fee, you know what I mean? There's set fees, percentages, that's why managers are there in place and everything like the business aspect of it is dialed in in a sense and for us here I feel like it's still catching up I think the problem here is we have a very small population that's one of the yeah so that's a major factor Mm. because we have a smaller pie in the beginning yeah right so because of that what it tends to breed is 
and and you know Melbourne is a certain size, but then you go to Adelaide or Perth or a smaller scene, and you're going to see this even more. Mm. And it's that. Um, and it was interesting how just before you said how the doof is underground and it used to be, but it it's used to not be. anymore. Yeah, this yeah. is big business now. Mm -hmm. And if people think it isn't, and this is what's weird in Australia is they are businesses who mm. are, they are mostly run as businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. Except we are, the rest of everybody is sold this sort of illusion that it's just mates and we're all just helping each other out. Mm -hmm. But quite often there are people at the top making serious bank yeah, through yeah, our yeah. hard work. And it's got to this point where I'm like, no, I know how much money you're taking away or I can guess. And you do need to pay for your proper people and whatever else that you want to do. If you want to run it as a business, if you want to run an underground doof with a few speakers in a, in a thing and you want me to help out, that's totally different. Yeah. That is completely different. And I've actually got some calls. I put up a little teaser pose. I don't know if you saw it the other day. I was like, it's time to plan illegal parties. Yeah, and I was yeah. just being cheeky. I just wanted to stir the pot a bit um, because obviously we're in the middle of a lockdown and we can't freaking plan anything right now. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've had some phone calls about some people wanting me to do some stuff or some fun things. And I'm like, sure, like, you know, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah, see maybe. what happens. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's uh, – it's – it's so good and refreshing to hear you say that, um, you know, these people make bank because I'm like, you know, people are very oblivious to it. But at the end of the day, you got to realize if the ticket prices are, you know, said $300 and you're selling at, you know, 4,000 and 3,000 people, you know, you do the maths. Sure, the, the cost of the festival could be like 700,000, you know. Some of these people are bad business managers and they actually don't make money for the first 10 years. Mm. I understand that, but they still need to pay their staff. Exactly, yeah. We can't be, if we're just being a fill-in role for whatever, we can't wear that financial risk. Mm, we're not mm. there for that, you know, so. Because you're essentially giving your, yourself to that um, institution, um, giving like a year, almost close to a year of your life just to run it. That's right, and you're representing them. So yeah. if you're a good operator, you want to represent them well. I mean, this is this is where the reputation I have is for being straight shooter and all of that, and it's because... I don't actually take drugs while I work at festivals and I yeah. don't actually rah, rah, rah. And I do actually take it quite seriously. And I yeah, think yeah, yeah. that's a bonus in some festivals and, and not in others where they don't want to run like that. So I think it depends who you're working with. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, there's, it's going to be a really interesting uh, see what happens this summer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you think it's going to come back? Um. I do not think it's going to come back in the format it has been, no. But I actually don't think that that's because of COVID. I think that they they have been trying to squish us for a long time already. Yeah, for sure. And, and this I, is the perfect excuse. Absolutely. All they are doing is being opportunistic. But we have seen a number of events last summer really get hammered by authorities in different ways, mm. whether it was permits or user pay police or, um, uh, you know, bushfire threat or a bunch of other fuckery. I mean, we could go into specific festival stories of which I have plenty, but I don't <laughs> generally like to do that because, um, it is private information. Well, really. it kind of, it is, you yeah. know, and also this is part of me being someone who takes it seriously. I'm not just going to um, shit on or, or we'll even divulge, you yeah. know, a lot of the stuff that really goes on in a public way. I mean, yeah. the whole way we managed to be underground for so long is we didn't do that. We didn't have social media where we shared every fucking thing we did. Mm. You know, we actually just talked like on the phone and in, in, in person, person to yeah. promote these things and to spread this community, which is why we had a bit of a community vibe. Yeah. And I feel like we've lost that as the entire scene has lost that. Yeah. Do you think there's a way to recapture it? It's too I late, don't think it? we will recapture anything. I think that things, these subcultures, they evolve, mm. you know, and after COVID, we will evolve. I don't know what it will look like yet. I definitely don't think we're all only going to rave online forever, ever. Like yeah. we need to gather. It's primal that we yeah. gather, humans gather together and dance. That hasn't changed throughout cultures for eons. That's not going to change. Mm. We need to dance and it doesn't matter whether we're white boys from broad meadows or it's part of our tribal heritage. That's actually what we need to do. Yeah. So I actually do feel like, um, something really exciting is going to happen next personally. And I feel like I can say that from this 20 year vision that I have, uh, uh, sorry, perspective that I have, it's not over. 
Yeah. But also, it was kind of broken. I yeah. feel like the scene was kind of broken. It was yeah. a little too commercial. It was a little too um, harangued by authorities. It was a little too much about fashion. We, you know, all the, the rubbish everywhere. The we, glam. we Yeah, we lost the point of the connection and the nature and the, all of that. Mm. So yeah. if we can reinvent ourselves to getting somewhere, a new place of understanding where, you know, I mean, a lot of kids who are in their 20s right now, they don't take drugs like we took drugs. No, they're hardcore, aren't they? They're, they're straight edge. They're like tea drinkers and shit. Oh, they're not the opposite. I no, I, I, no, I'm saying the younger people are taking a lot less yeah, okay. drugs than we generally took in our 20s. And I'm 40, so I'm saying this two decades. Two decades, yeah. How old are you? I'm 30. Okay, so I'm 40, you're 30, they're 20. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's like there's a generational thing happening. And most of the people, the teriyaki guys and all that, they're mid to late 40s. So mm. I actually hung out with people that were quite a bit older than me in the beginning. Yeah. Um, but the the younger kids, I was reading an article the other day. They're not they're not taking as many hard drugs. So even that is going to change what it looks like. And now we have this technology. We have this global connected network. We didn't have that. Mm -mm. So I don't know what it's going to look like, but I, I'm pretty excited about it. I think that it will evolve. You know. Yeah. Will we ever recreate the doofs of our first early years? No, probably not in a while. Yeah, you know? I, I I romanticize it a lot because Me too. because <laughs> <laughs> I came to Australia like you know I was when I was sixteen, seven, you know, fifteen, even watching those you know old school rave movies and stuff like that, and I'm mm. like, that, that's you know, e even the scene from Blade, <laughs> the little blood rave scene, you know, with all the vampires dancing mm -hmm. in the blood. I'm like, there's something really cool about that scene, you know, mm. and I felt like maybe that's what warehouse raves. They were, they were you know raw. They were. Um, just um, <sighs> mysterious. There was some, some something you couldn't put your finger on, and but they still happen. They they still happen, and and every now and then occasionally, I'm, occasionally, and every now and then I'm 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 definitely like taken aback and surprised, you know. Mm -hmm. And I love it when when that happens to me at a party. I'm like yes, but more often than not now I'm just like yeah, it's a cool yeah, it's a big production festival and this and that, and usually the the, the funnest you know times are the you know, the renegade, you know, the yeah, but renegade do you know sets. what that is? That's not even the scene. That's us. That's, that's us. us and that's, that's growing what... up and changing and being like, well, I've seen this. You've seen it a hundred times. I've seen it 200 times. And we're like, maybe I need something else now. Yeah. You know, maybe I need something else to sort of take me there, whatever that is or whatever the moment is. And I, and honestly, that's why over the last couple of, you know, decade or so, I realized that I get way more fulfillment doing that role you see me in stuck in the office solving the curly problems and questions mm. than actually just getting a bit nihilistic on the dance floor. Like yeah. I get way more out of the sense of accomplishment and team building and all of that from, yeah, yeah. from running shit rather than being a consumer of it. You know? Yeah, yeah. You Because you start to be step into the role of being a leader as well and, you know, um, and people hold you accountable but you also hold other people accountable but they look up to you at the same time. Mm that's been organic as well, but yeah. I do, I do appreciate that role now. And that's why I, I, I joke around that I'm the, the, the grandma raver mm. on site <laughs> because I'm 41 yeah. and a lot of the, the people I'm working with are literally two decades younger. Yeah, they yeah. literally could be my kid or you know what I mean? They're the, yeah. And so, well, actually they could be my kid. That's a bit freaky, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's not go there. Got any children don't know about? <laughs> no, uh, no. <laughs> Just furry ones. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I think that I, I also really value those people who have stuck around in the scene. And and this is – it's funny you mentioned Gunga before because I was at um, Tanglewood a couple of years ago. I think we might have been the same, yeah, the same, we, same party. I know the party Yeah, we about. met there and, um, and I was walking across at the end of a busy day and there's Gunga and he's like, Bo Kitty. He's like, what the hell are you still doing in the paddock with the radio? And I'm like, dude, I've never left. <laughs> and he's like, me neither. And we, we hadn't seen each other in years and we totally reconnected and we had a really nice chat and it was like, gee, it's nice to see some of some of these people still around, you know, yeah, some of our old the school OGs. crew. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. still sort of trying to push the uh, push the narrative that we're all in this together, you know. I love talking to people like that. Mm. I um, uh, It was one year Maya festival that I used to be involved, um, you know, Robin Mutoid. I love Robin Mutoid. So Robin rocks up in his bus. Yeah. And I'm just like, holy shit, you're Robin Mutoid. And 
nobody there knows who he is. Like like a few people do, you know. Yep. But I'm like the people at the gate, I, and I'm like I'm running. The, I was running the gate. Let him through. Get let out of the way. Get, get out of the way. way. That's Robin Muzo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, so I'm like who? I'm like dude. dude. <laughs> You do have no idea yeah. who this man is and yeah. what, what he's done for our scene and, yes. and for the scene globally. It's like this guy started a movement in the 80s. You I know? talk about Robert Mutoid like the dad I never had, basically. <laughs> yeah. And in at that Millennium Earth Core 2000, he and I sat on top of a hill and he put these flamethrowers in a pathway through the valley and he gave me the controller and we were setting off the flamethrowers as people walked under them and just giggling like teenagers, you know, and that was my memory of like Millennium mm. was him giving me the fire controller, Give you know. The power. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Robin so much. Yeah. His, um, and I was very surprised like as to his like sort of personality stuff because I didn't know, you know, I, you hold someone in such a high He's a regard. mad scientist. He's a mad scientist, yes. but he's really nice. He's beautiful, isn't he? You know. A very um, gentle man. I, uh. Uh, yeah, and once, you know, we parked his bus and I was like, just give us a second. We're going to go get, you know, your wristbands and stuff. He's like, oh, it's all good. I can, I'm, I'm going to eat some food. And then he's like, Drew, would you like to come in? Would you like to have some tea? I'm like, call on the radio. Uh, you guys get on the gate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we're sweet. We got it sorted, man. All right, I'm just going to go for a 10-minute break, all right? <laughs> yeah. Which ended up being like a two-hour break. Yes, just course. like hanging out with Robin in the bus and just like, man, yeah. tell me, tell me things, tell me stories. and mm. um. Yeah, as a he's a cool guy. Yeah, he I'd, is. I'd love to have him here. Maybe you can help me. Um, I can connect you with him. Yeah, because yeah. he he's not a very easy man to no, he's pin not. down, right? But he does have an email address. Okay, and he yep. does he does answer he it. He does answer it. Yes, we yep. were we were trying to work on a crazy ass project a couple of years ago. He has this boat called. Oh, it's not his boat, but he knows people called Ship of Fools, and it's a boat mm. where they travel around the world and and they they're they're true um like um pirate performance gypsy type people who and the the plant the project we were working on was to sail the boat to Perth take it out of the water Robin was going to build a conveyor and we were going to take it through Uluru like it was insane so I was getting quotes from the road authorities to drop the power lines from Perth to Alice Springs they were in on it I was trying to get a in, you, you, I was trying to get information about whether that was a possible or what? Like, can you do it? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it got to this point where we, Robin was like, we're going to need Clive Palmer to pay for this, you know? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, do you know him? Because I don't know him. Yeah. <laughs> not the, exactly the individual that we want involved in. No, but that's why he wanted wanted him to pay for it. Because he was like, oh, it all makes sense, you know? With Anyway, so that was something I worked on briefly with him a little while ago, just to see if we just, you know, sometimes you just got to run down the road of crazy projects to see if, See if there's any spark there. See see what's possible. But yeah, yeah, yeah no, it didn't happen. <laughs> that's that's amazing. <laughs> yep. And and his is his ex partner Sands. Is it Sands? Uh, I'm not sure. No, I always confuse. I was confused. Anyway, anyways, moving moving on. Mm. Um, so you know, obviously we've covered the ground of your involvement, your heavy involvement into the operation side. Um, what are the what festivals have you worked across the years? Like you, you said, Matreya earlier. Matreya for a couple of years uh, at the end there. Um, Earthcore in the beginning, but not the end. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rainbow Serpent for many years, um, but not this year, luckily. Um, uh, what else? Um, Tanglewood for a couple of years. Uh, Rabbit Seat Lettuce and Bohemian Beat Freaks up in northern New South Wales. Um, yeah, and, and then the nightclubs for 10 years and all those sort of spin-off events and whatever. Mm. Um, and then back in Adelaide, it was the, the club was called Sand Pit, and we even put on like a, an Earthcore back in 1998 there for them or I don't know, something. Like Earthcore in... In, in Adelaide yeah. or something. Spiro, Spiro was everywhere. He was, but what people forget is that Earthcore was four people. Spiro was one of them. Yeah, that's... that's um, I've so, always wanted to know the backstory well, of that. Earthcore was four people. So Green Ant... Uh, Which is Rainbow, essentially, right? Like Green Ant Productions. Uh, Green is... Ant was Rainbow, but some of the people... It was a bit of a crossover back in the day. Mm. So anyway, Earthcore started off being uh, Pip, um, Darval, Spiro, Carl, uh, who was also DJ, and, uh, and Krusty, who was... You know, DJ Krusty. Eugene? Eugene, exactly. Yeah, okay. So they were the four people, and they all had very different roles. Like, Carl and Krusty were DJs, but Pip and Spiro never were. Spiro was just marketing. Yep. That's what he was, and he was good at it, 
you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other people did all of the actual other things. Like marketing is not anything on the ground. It's all of that other stuff out in the world. And, and back then there wasn't a social media, so he'd be doing a lot of the ground Whole work. Whole postering and building mm-hmm. hype and all of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So when I started working for Earthcore, it was, four, it was the four of them, you know? And then a couple of them split off, and I don't quite know how all that went down, but the last uh, couple that I worked, uh, Pip was still involved, so it was Pip and Spiro. Mm. Um, and honestly, <laughs> Earthcore used to treat me with respect and pay me. And then I left and went and did other things. And then it all kind of seemed, sounded like it went a bit pear shaped and I never really had that much involvement after that, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. but it's been a really tricky one because, um, I know that, you know, there's been a lot of bad blood in this scene in the past and whatever, but, um, I personally just really feel like um, pointless bitching on other people's behalf really isn't conducive to anything. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so there's been situations where we're standing in a circle at a nightclub and someone starts talking about Spiro and I'm just like, no, nope, I'm not having this conversation. I just walk away. Yeah, like, I'm yeah. not going to sing his praises, but I'm also not going to defame. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah, I, just, yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. really we have to be careful. Um, and, and, you know, he was an absolute – asshole to me a few times on site um i can relate as are most promoters to be honest <laughs> yeah. um when they're stressed and and whatever whatever um but yeah i actually um i have earthcore on my website as one of the many parties that i've worked and i have caught some serious shit in melbourne duffers because of that just that yeah. it's even there and it's like you kids don't actually know who started this shit do you because earthcore was like one of the first really yeah you know. Not just in Australia, but apparently even in, in the world. Well, I mean, right? like the, UK, like... the UK was always ahead of us. Okay. So every everything that from the scene, the UK uh, did it first. Okay. <laughs> Which okay. is kind of like Robin Mutoid's from over there. Yeah. So Robin Mutoid was involved in, he told me some crazy stories like of going into a warehouse where they sealed the bottom six feet and then filled it with water and fluoro paint so that everyone was dancing in waist deep fluoro paint all night. Like amazing shit, and this is like in the in the nineties, early nineties. Yeah, you know, um, from the eighties, that was what was born. You know, so I think sometimes uh, the commercialization that we see now, it's not actually how it began. Mm. You know, and so even some people who aren't actually much younger than me, um, but didn't have that early doof experience, all they've really seen is that commercial aspect of it. Yeah. And the nihilistic drug taking aspect of it, which is what I've seen a lot of. Yeah, you know, and, and they've been turned off by that, and I don't yeah. blame them. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. Mm. Or not, not even turned off, but just not seen the value because J- of jaded. I uh, well, use the word yeah, jaded. Totally. Yeah. S- totally jaded. But some of them are jaded without actually having been there. Is what I'm getting at. Ah, uh, okay. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. For me, I feel like it's. Um, one of it is the nihilistic drug taking and sort of mm. not re- I'm over it. I'm like, look, man, you do what you yeah. want to do and I respect that. And, you know, sometimes it's nice to participate and sometimes it's just, um, you know, you do what you want to do. I'm not going to judge you. But mm. for me, I'm, again, I'm forever searching for that nostalgic, um, romanticized moment or, you know, vibe of a party that I would have seen in, in earlier rave movies, you know, growing mm. up in the Middle East, very sheltered from mm. that kind of stuff yes. going that looks like so much fun and mm. you know uh and i feel like you know it exists it it's does. it's out there but it, it has to it's be fleeting <laughs> yeah it's fleeting it's a unique environment you know uh i would love to see more street parties you know every time like, oh they're all gone though they're all gone the council you know fuck them all exactly but that's yeah. what makes our culture so i miss so them rich. Noir. Yeah. the brunswick the um uh, sorry the, the reggae no, no no the the brunswick uh, not brunswick street um smith street yeah brunswick street the brunswick street street rave yeah was amazing like it ended a long time ago but we're talking fifty thousand people literally raving in all the side streets and hanging off all of the street lights and Mm. i mean that shit was amazing you know and the um the brunswick music festival tries to recreate that now by opening up the street and rah, 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 but it's, it's not the same. Do you think it's because the music is tame or they've got it so regulated? And It's regulation. We live in a nanny country. We really do. Mm. It's really hard to do random shit here. Europe doesn't have those constraints. Yeah. I, I wonder because I'm like, if we used to do it, 
when did it change and why did it change? Is it because of drug deaths? Is it because of, you know... Um, Conservative government is the only reason that has changed. It's nothing to do... So people in seat, people in power... Absolutely. We've had, we've had less drug deaths than the UK because it's harder to get the drugs over here across the ocean. <laughs> like, honestly, like, there is nothing this scene has done that warrants the level of... Um, Red tape. Yeah, and it's also not the doof scene I'm talking about. I'm talking about that right now in Australia, there is a war on arts and culture. And I've mm. been very vocal about this during the last few months. Yeah. There, there really is. There is a war here on arts and culture. Sport is elevated and arts has been demoted. Mm. And this is a real problem in Australia, you know. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually quite scared for the future generation that we're talking about, the 20-year-olds who are about to want to gather and dance, mm. how they're going to be able to do that. They're going to have to do it wearing footy shorts. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think that that is something that we need to... Address. Talk about more. Yeah. yeah. You know, the fact that none of this stuff is to do with drug deaths. There's, there's, drug de there's deaths all the time that we don't hear about, mm. you know, but one raver wraps his car around a tree and suddenly it's a drug death. Yeah. When it may not even be a drug death. It always pisses me off when you see, like, you know, the, the trash at the horse races and all that. Uh -huh. and, and it's just like, yeah. you know, you are the people who are, who are demoting us for doing what we're trying to do. But yeah. then look at how you conduct yourselves in that sort of public or party-like context. Yeah, but um, there's money involved in that side. You know, and, and that's what um, I feel like it's, it's one of those things that you just go, mm. <laughs> you know, uh, I I wish I mean I don't know maybe do, should we all just like work in office should we just try and get in Hell an office no. so, so we can actually change some of these conservative laws like how can we address this you mm. know? and this is what I've been talking about with people like I mean it makes me really uncomfortable that people tell me I should go into politics like mm. it makes me really uncomfortable like I have rejected that entire system most of my life yeah but I don't know how to enact bigger change I I want to. Yeah. You know, I want to be the leader that I have accidentally become mm -hmm. just by doing what I've been doing. Um, I don't know what that looks like. You know, I actually had a client come to me for a reality check who had run for local government and he got um, really attacked by other people because they didn't want him to win. And, I mean, he got dragged through the mud. Yeah, and they, they've tried to find dirt on him and stuff like absolutely. that. Absolutely. He was really quite damaged from it. And mm -hmm. he was coming to me to work out whether he needed to do a positive PR campaign to change that. Yeah, wow. You know, and so having that insight to everything that he'd gone through uh, really made me question whether I would want to go to be in local government or not. Of course, you know? of course. Um, That's why they want to push you away from it, you know what I mean? They want to, like... Scare you off. It's going to scare you off. It's mm. the same thing as, like, trying to go for, like, a president of the United States or something like that. They're just going to... Well, Kanye's doing it, so... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm the rock, the rock for president. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'd rather Arnie at this point. <laughs> yeah, the Terminator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People have been going and going like Joe Rogan should be president, you know, but... Um, well, I don't know about that either. No, yeah. I, I really felt like America could have a chance with Bernie Sanders. That's just my opinion, but, mm. you know, he gets labeled a socialist and, and all these, you know, different political... Compared to those guys, he is one, you know. But, yeah, um, but... For me, it's like you know, a lot of his policies they make they make sense. They're yeah. not they're not trying to like sw not swerve, but um, you know, they're not leaning towards uh, you know communism or anything like that. They're just common sense. Like yeah, I think we need to. I think what twenty twenty has shown us is that all these isms mm. need to go. Yeah, none of them work on their own. They don't work. Communism doesn't really work on its own. No. Anarchy doesn't work on its own. Like Nihilism, dictate. Uh, no, yeah. no. Uh, we uh, these are ways of thinking about politic political structures and societal structures, and I really feel like we need to start talking. It's not this or that anymore. Mm. We must be taking some bits from here, some bits from there. Yeah. You know, the capitalism what? isn't all bad, but the way we've been doing it. Is, yeah. is what's messed us up. We need to refine the process. That's right. Yeah, so right. I, I sort of get frustrated when people want to paint you as a this-ism or a that-ism. Mm -hmm. and, and the media does it so well. Of course. And like humans, we like to categorize things. It helps our minds. So you and I have agreed that because we speak English, if I say, look at the horse, you acknowledge, yeah, I've agreed that that's a horse. Mm. So we have that understanding. 
But where it goes wrong is where we overlay that same sort of need for categorization and stereotypes onto everything around us. Then everyone becomes an ism mm. or an anti-ism. Yeah. You know, uh, I put up a post the other day about the whole Karen stereotype. I'm not down. I don't even I don't even know where that came from, and I don't even understand it really. Yeah, well, I'm not down. Basically, um, it started as a as a comment um, about uh, white women having uh, privilege uh, to use uh, to speak to the manager. Um, it started as a comment about racial privilege, mm. but now now all these other people have adopted it and turned it into a haircut and all this other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and and now it's become every white woman ev- everywhere who you ha- conduct yourself should yourself. shut up. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but I am not about silencing anyone at this point, mm. you know. Um, so, yeah, so I think we need to be careful with some of those stereotypes and mm. categories, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, it's um, this kind of brings me to uh, – to segue back into more of what you do, mm. uh, you know, you said we don't need isms and stuff. And what I'm get aiming at here is we need a more holistic approach of looking at our society and we Absolutely. need a more, you know, encompassing and inclusive way of, you know, just even making policies. Absolutely. Um, that brings me to, you know, your your business, Reality Check, mm. uh, which, you know, you, what it says on the website, you're a holistic, um, holistic coach. Business coach. Business coach. Mm. Um, I want to talk to you about, yeah, your sort of your process. Um, first off, how did you come up with the idea of the business? Obviously, we've talked about your festival, um, your festival work, a body of work, and um, we've established the sort of con- contextual mm. um, experience that you have and how it can contribute to something like Reality Check. But where was it that you sort of went, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to put this into effect. And how do you put it into effect? Well, it was an accident as well. So a lot of my (laughs) career has been happy accidents, I guess. But I was working at an art studio uh, with graffiti artists as a production manager. And we were doing very high profile graffiti installs for... Sorry, where is this uh, art gallery? I'd I'd probably rather not say just because of the story I'm about to tell you. Okay. Okay. So I was working for a... Graffiti art studio, basically, okay. working for major clients. In Melbourne. In Melbourne, okay. doing stuff for Crown Casino and Infinity Cars and things like that. And there was a couple of art, and the artists had studios in there. Anyway, there was a couple of artists that were um, extremely uh, down at the time. And this one guy had been through a uh, engagement breakup, and he couldn't make art. Mm. And so one day we were all trying to cheer him up. And everyone was a bit down in the studio. And I was like, let's go and drink a beer at Section 8 and have a beer instead. So I sat down with this guy and I was like, do you mind me asking you these questions in front of all these other workmates of yours? And he's like, no problem. And I was like, okay, so when was the last time that you felt like limitless joy? And he's like, oh, I can't even remember. I'm like, no, go back. When was it? When was it? What was it doing? And he was like, honestly, it was fishing. (laughs) I didn't expect this guy to say fishing is a graffiti artist. Yeah. But he's Malaysian. And he fished a lot as a kid. Yep. And the first thing that I put on his action list, the next thing he had to go and do was go fishing. And so anyway, I set this list for him. And at the end of this couple of pints that we had, the artists were like, what was that thing that you just did? <laughs> that whole thing. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and they're like, that, that thing that you just did in front of us, that's amazing. And mm. you need to do that. And I was like, I just do this for people. Like people come to me with problems all the time. Mm. I had a queer friend years and years ago come to me for advice about reconciling his queerness with his Christian beliefs and how that can work because he grew up in a church that didn't accept him. Yeah. And we talked about that. Now, I'm not Christian. I'm also not queer or I'm not gay, you know. And so I don't know why I could give him advice about that. Mm. But we got to a place where he got somewhere good with it. Okay. So for years I've had people seek me out for counsel about various things. Mm. And anyway, the artists in the studio were running a market, a little creative market, and they were like, will you do that at the market? And I was like, I don't know how I do that at the market, but sure. So I printed up a sign and I sat at a table and I did reality check tarot readings kind of thing. (laughs) Basically, I did, yeah. Yeah. And at that time, I was charging $15 for 15 minutes. Short, sharp, 
and yep. in there and I had four subjects that people could pick. Uh, one was relationships, one was uh, business strategy, there's a few other things. And um, yeah, those first couple of markets, I did actually have people sit down and pay me who were totally strangers to yeah. help them get some clarity around stuff. Yeah. And at the end of that, I was like, okay, well, this whole sitting at a table thing, uh, waiting for people to sit down, this is not how this should look. This is not the format. For no. Yeah, yeah. And it's taken me, it's taken me seven years to get where I am now. To refine. Mm, but where I am now is, um, I've had like, I don't know, maybe four or 500 clients around the world. Wow. Um, some people have seen me over years. Other people see me once. Just depends. It depends on their needs, obviously, you know. Depends how self-motivated they are. Yeah. Depends how ready to hear the truth they are. Mm -mm. I mean, I named my business Reality Check for a reason. You don't come to me if you just want your balls cupped. <laughs> That's not what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's not what I do. Yeah. So I, I, I branded myself that way for a reason. Yeah. You know, like you, you come because you have tried the things and now you need some real help mm. and you need you need a reality check, basically. Yeah. Um, and the process of what that looks like has also been refined over seven years. I mean, at the start, someone likened me once at the start to the Oracle in the Matrix <laughs> where they sit down at the kitchen table and I give them a cookie, cookie. and tell them what's going to happen. <laughs> it was like that for the first year. I literally sat at my kitchen table, made them a cup of tea and we talked about shit. Yeah. But then after a while I was like, no, this needs, the dynamic needs to change. I need to formalize my processes. Um, mm. I need to get better, better at coaching as well. Um, so did you seek, did you seek your own sort of like coach in a sense? Like I've did had, you see like mentors? Mentors is probably. I've had mentors over the years. Mm. Um, but I think what I do is so different and that's why the word holistic and the word business are really important because there's a lot of holistic healers and all kinds of, that's not me. And also there's a lot of business coaches out there who want your business plan. I, I'm going to tell you to rip up your business plan. Yep. I mean, that's what I'm going to do. Most mm -hmm. business plans are absolute bullshit and they're based in nothing to do with reality. They're just numbers on a page. Yeah. So some people have gone to do Nice where they've done the however many weeks of business course, they've written up this plan. They come to me and they show it. And I'm like, is any of this relevant to you? And they're like, none of it. And I'm like, so exactly. We've got to rip it up and start again. Because Nice is not set up for creative businesses. Yeah. Really. My, yeah. my wife did it. I mean, it, it served her well a little mm. bit not in the marketing side of thing but more so in the accounting side of things because yes. her business you know her business the nature of her business does involve having to um you know uh, for every client for every workshop that she does she you know money yeah there's money and so she needed to develop a sense of a of a paper trail mm. which you know i i do feel it is accounting isn't it really i mean i got taught you know um, international business and business like from high school and one of the most important things that my I had a really good business teacher. Um, he was pretty. He was a hard man in a sense of um, he was very strict in the classroom. Was very structured. But I got it was one of my favorite classes to go to because he taught it so well. He was this Canadian um, mm -hmm. guy, and um, yeah, he was like, you, you need to have some sense of the law and some sense of accounting absolutely because the law affects the way you, you run your business and mm. you know and you need you know if you're doing it online you need, mm. you know you want to be legit mm. you want to be able to at some point pay your taxes or like even oh you know, god yes oh i'm working with people on all that stuff don't you worry you know, and, and i yeah. did like for someone who studied business his whole life and mm. went to rmit to study it i did accounting yet i had no idea how to do australian accounting like ah. actually run my business in a, in a certain way mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, because yes. it's completely different. Totally different. S studying yes. general ledgers and balance sheets is is like doing accounting for corporations. Mm. You know, that's what you're really studying for. It does not take into account of okay, cool, you've studied the ma management side of you know, okay, mm. sole trader, you have this liability unlimited, mm. blah blah blah. But when it comes to the like crux of it, it's like, hey, what do I need to do to structure my business mm. and my financial financials in a yeah. way? that are going to allow me to see, you know, my path a bit more clearly. That's right. So that's one thing that I do f think maybe niece, is, maybe niece is good at. It's oh, it depends what business you're running. And for some yeah. people it's a great help. Like yeah, I know yeah. some people who've really used it as a springboard and it's been amazing. But yeah. quite honestly, there are a lot of people who that business plan they come out of it with, it's totally irrelevant, irrelevant. for their industry mm -hmm. yeah. and their networks, who is their potential clients. Yeah. So yeah. that whole thing that you just said about business structure, I'm good at that. 
because yeah. I've set up a bunch of things. Yeah, and festivals as well, like the structure. Yeah, but yeah. once it gets to the point where someone's like, do I go with PTY LTD or do I continue blah, 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 I'm like, this is what I think. Mm -hmm. Go talk to my expert. And this is where I started the agency just last year because mm. I have a range of experts now around me who've helped me do all of this stuff. And now I can provide them to all my clients. Yeah. So I'll give you some basic notes on the structure of what you're thinking of doing. And then I will handball you to someone who is that person. The expert, yeah. You're Absolutely. outsourcing in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I'm not an accountant. And of I've course. never studied it like you have. So I don't yeah. know any of that. No, I'm not great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can do plus minus divides. I can't <laughs> do plus and minus without a calculator, really. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, numbers are not my forte. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what does what does a reality check process look like? Like when a client sits with you, is it is do you have sort of um, the same way like you know businesses have like KPIs or something like that? Do you have like certain um, key points that you go, let's look at this, let's start with this? Well, every, every person I work with is incredibly different. Mm -hmm. Like as in, no formula fits all for sure. Yeah, but I just mean like they come from such different industries as well. Like most of them are a similar demographic. Most of them are um, mid thirties or or early thirties mm -hmm. to late forties. They're in that middle part of their. That's when we decide that we want to get get our shit together. That's right. And, that, and also, we've already tried some things. Mm. So I've done a few reality checks for people in their early twenties. They're not ready. They're yeah. not ready for what I have to deliver. They haven't tried enough stuff. If they need a little pep talk and encouragement, I can provide that. Mm -hmm. But they're not really ready to sort of work on hardcore strategy for what they're doing at that point, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I started off by just starting with rapid fire questioning. And soon, a couple of years in, after the Oracle moments, I realized that that wasn't actually going to work for my clients anymore for me to really support them. Mm. So now I have a process. I've, I've, our, um, I've worked out a process where uh, we, we have a brief interaction or an email or something and then I send them a list of questions and they have to deep dive first. Mm. So they have to do some work first before I even start working for them. And those questions are quite broad. Um, things like what challenges are you faced with right now? You know, mm. and um, those questions, some people send me back six pages, which is great. That's what I want. You want, you want, I want detail. six pages. I don't want one sentence. That doesn't tell me shit. Yeah. I want a lot of info. And then I go and research them basically. Mm. So for some people, that means going through their website and socials and all of that. Other people don't have a web presence. So it's goes that then my research is about their venture and what they want to do and maybe who they are and some of that stuff. Um, and then when we do actually meet for a coaching session, they've already told me what they're struggling with. I already have looked at their stuff. I've probably already got a list of things that I'd like them to look at doing mm. differently or better. Homework. Yeah, and um, and then we spend an hour of, of, of proper coaching and I go quite fast and I swear and I have a disclaimer on my website that says sorry in advance if swearing offends you because I get really excited. Yeah. So I'm not going to censor my occasional fuck yeah because yeah. people might be offended. Um, yeah. So And yeah. then I do, I check in if I'm going too fast or, or whatever for them. Um, I also don't allow any screens in session. Nice. Because I believe in the magic of writing things down. I saw I saw that actually in your two minute um, was it two and a half minute video? C cool video, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, With I'm Dan like, in it, yep. definitely. Yeah, Dan's in it, and definitely, I was just like, I I, I definitely have wanted to come to you um, and and seek your uh, seek the oracle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> About what specifically? So I, I want to bend spoons <laughs> with my eyes. Um, uh, about a lot of things. Uh, I won't get into it no. now. Um, but uh, yeah, I saw that Dan in the video was I was writing it on a piece of paper. Yeah, and, and it's funny because my process is always with a laptop. Even when I, w if I was to ever write lyrics, I prefer to just write it on a laptop. And most guys aren't like that. Like for example, hip hop guys would be like, no, I prefer to pen. Pen. Yeah. But I'm like, no, I just I can't read my own handwriting. See, I write my pieces on the computer, mm. but when we're doing work together. Like, because the other thing is I allow people to record the session. Oh, so good. they've got the recording anyway of everything we're talking about, if they want to do that. Yeah. What they're writing is the homework. Mm. And people don't leave a session unless they have an A4 page of homework from me. Okay. And this is why some people only see me once. is because I've just given them an A4 page of things to do to get to their dream. And sometimes seeing that list is enough for them to realize that their dream's not the dream. Yeah. 
And other people come back to me one month later and they go, yep, I've done the list and now what are we doing? Mm. So that's why I do that. I don't, I've spent so long in the music industry. I, I ran a couple of agencies, like music booking agencies. I used to book the guy a gig, wake him up, give him drugs to get him out of the house, put him in the car, take him to the club, put him on stage. Like, I am so sick of babying people that, that I created this business to not have to do that. Yeah. I created this business for self-motivated people who just need a little guidance and strategy mm. and help and support. They're already self-motivated. Yeah. You know, and so that's why I really believe in giving a lot of long, like we look at the big picture. It's not just about the challenges you're faced with this week, this month. It's about, I mean, I often ask people in 10 years, what do you actually want to be doing with your day? Like not, I want to be a, a so-and-so. It's mm, like, mm. what do you actually want your day to be about? Because if you want to be in nature for seven hours, this computer job that you're looking at now, it's only a stepping stone. That's not the end goal. Yeah. You know, so I think that's what the, the process is about macro and micro. What is the long-term goals and what is the dream? And sometimes during a session, I have to stop and ask people, is this dream to make money for your life? Because sometimes I have clients who they don't have financial problems. They're not looking to make it their side hustle. Mm. They just want to explore this other creative side of themselves and they have plenty of money, but that will change what we do with it. Mm. So I do ask people, what is your budget to push this forward? It's such an important part of the... the do uh, you have financial room to move right now or not? Mm -hmm. Because if you've got no money, then I'm not going to tell you to do a $3,000 website rebuild. I'm going to tell you how to do it for free. Yeah. Because that's relevant to you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. It's... Yeah. um. It's uh, f First off, one question that I had while you were saying that is, um, how much do you think discipline comes into it because that's a, everything so you know much. because for me the thing that kills me is the discipline and yep. so the last two years of my life since being a father has been cultivating this discipline that you know my parents always used to say oh you're gonna be successful you have to have discipline this and i'm like well show me how i don't mm. know how to have discipline you know i don't want to go to school i don't want to you know you need to be careful with that word though and i'm all about language yeah. discipline is not a good word generally for most of us Mm. Discipline means being smacked on the wrist, being told exactly, off. Exactly, yeah. That's yeah. not the right word. And, and this is what I have been like, I've been, I'm reading this book called The Power of Habits, right? Yes. Uh, I haven't finished it. Um, I'm halfway through it. But even just like the first few chapters, almost instantly, uh, this was last year, I started just applying what this book was saying. Yes. You know, and trying to change my, my habits, but, but also understanding the nature of habits. That yes. There's a habit. Have you, have you heard of that book? Uh, uh, I haven't heard of it specifically, but um, have you heard of the habit loop in general? Just uh, do you, uh, do you I, I do have worked with a lot of that stuff and uh, do sort of pull on a lot of that stuff to help people yeah. get sorted. But what's so interesting is people come to me sometimes for a, a weekly schedule plan. They're like, I can't, I can't get disciplined. I can't get motivated. I can't finish anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so what does your day look like? And they're like, oh, I rise at 10. I have lunch at midday. I start drinking at four. Da, da, da. And I'm like, so actually you only have two hours where you actually do stuff. Mm. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I guess I kind of do. Yeah. And the thing is, I'm not emotionally involved. I'm not emotionally involved in them drinking or in anything to do with them. So it doesn't, it's not a... Do you know what I mean? There's that, yeah, that yeah, separation yeah. out there. It allows uh, you to be truthful as well. Yeah, um, and so sometimes it's about reframing those those narratives. So instead of discipline, think of the word drive. Mm. Because discipline is you're already being disciplined for what you're not doing before you've even tried. Whereas drive and motivation, those are the things that keep you on track with what those things are. Yeah. And so often what, what I do with Reality Check is literally just accountability. Mm -hmm. So we would talk about the fact that you're a dad and I'd be like, what does that look like? And you're like, well, I have her on my own for these t couple of days. Da -da -da -da. Like even the fact that I walked in here and you said, we've got a babysitter for three days so we can do our stuff. No, off. that is music to my ears mm -hmm. because a lot of parents, they don't prioritize their own stuff. Yeah. Thank and <laughs> there's nothing wrong with your, how old is she? Two years old. There's nothing wrong with your two year old toddler being with a babysitter or the grandparents or whoever they're with for a couple of days so that you guys fill your cups mm. doing your respective things and you can come together as better parents. But that's a valuing of your own creativity yeah. that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, yeah. You know? And so 
when you talk about discipline, I'd be like, well, what are the five things you're not finishing? You know, and you'd be like, oh, this, 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 and this. And I'm like, and which ones are really bothering you? And you're like, well, these two things are really bothering yeah, me. I can already not. tell you mine. For <laughs> tell me what they are. Um, I want to finish music. I've got so many little, little, um, you know, what could be five minute tracks. Mm. And I've been, you know, uh, dying to, to finish them. Yes. And it's been my goal. It's just, who cares about how good it is? Just finish it. Well, this is the problem with almost every musician I've worked mm. with ever. Yeah. And it is perfectionism, not completionism. For, for me, it's not actually, it used to be perfectionism. I don't care about that. I've like put that, that aside. Mm. It's, it's literally just, um, a matter of time. Mm. I don't have that luxury and I don't have the financial cushioning to, yes. you know, pursue like, I, I was telling my friends, uh, at the end of the, that's this week, I was like, I need a creative holiday. Lo and behold, I'm not working construction for three weeks. And I'm actually kind of going, you know, I don't really want to be working on a job site where I'm, yep. you know, even though I'm working with my friends and it's awesome and I enjoy doing what I'm doing, but I don't want to be yelled at and this and that. When I'm like, when I'm in here, I'm the boss. Yes. You know, I'm the creative person. And, and I've, again, through reading the book about habits and, mm. and really just like being in this ever pursuit to become a better person, but also to become more efficient. That's one thing construction is, t is starting to teach me. And it is why I like it. It's teaching me to be faster. Mm. It's teaching me not to dwell on my own problems and just like- Get the job done. Get the job done. Yep. Make, you know, and, and also the fact that you're waking up early in the morning and going to the job site and having to show up yep. 20 minutes before. And that being late is like a thing with me. It's like plagued me my whole life, right? You're always late. I'm always late. And on top of that, I'm Arab. There's a funny running joke. <laughs> Is there? Yeah, there's a, okay, uh, okay. Uh, Arab time. Okay, and my okay. Wife, um, my wife's like, you know, no, no, it's real. It's not just him. Yes. You know, uh, people in the Middle East are like, it's genetic. No, 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 it's no, genetic. No, <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it, this is the differences between, you know, cross cultural exchanges, right? Mm. In the West, it's very like, let's take German people. It's like, if we're there at seven, you know, we're there at seven. If you're not there, you know, it's like, mm. for me, it's like, yeah, you know, you come on 20 minutes late. I don't care. It's fine. But it's different now. You're working in Australia, mm. you're in a different country, you're, mm. you're working in a job site where you're on people, people's times, you mm. know? And it was, it was my best friend, Arthur, who, you know, he's Malaysian and, and, you know, most, I don't want to, I'm not going to, you know, stereotype yeah, yeah. races or anything, but um, Asian people are generally quite, you know, they stick to times and they're very punctual and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And my mate Arthur's very, he's very organized. He's very... Do you know what, though? Can I just make a comment about that? Yeah. And this is, again, more generalization. Yeah, yeah. But in a lot of the, in a lot of Asian countries, they must be like that because they have so many people. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm. in Japan, the trains run on time every second. Duh, 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 and you yeah. must single file into this side and that side. And if you go down the other way you're going to get plowed over because there's a sea of people coming at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I haven't been to wherever you're from or whatever. Bahrain, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I have traveled in some other countries uh, where, like, for example, Bal Bali time is a thing. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Bali time is a thing is because nothing runs on time. Yeah. Nothing. And so if someone says 20 minutes, oh, it's like maybe an hour, maybe two hours, like yeah. roughly a few because nothing's actually running on time. So it's almost not even um, – it's almost like a, a product of the environments that people grow up in, mm. that sort of need for time, you know? Like yeah, yeah. when I dated in New York, here's a good story. So I went to New York and I dated people on Tinder. And I'm used to sort of Aussie dating where, you know, oh, we're going to meet up for dinner. Then meeting up for dinner means a couple of drinks, then dinner, maybe we go out, maybe something, something, see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in New York it was literally like 6 o'clock for one hour dinner. I've got to go to another date, see you. At seven o'clock, and I was like, "Oh, oh, really?" Yeah, two dates in one night. They had like four dates in one night, and I thought that like a date was like the date for the night. Wow! But in New York, it's like, "Oh, you, you're lucky to get this hour with me." Now I got to, I got to something else. Yeah, yeah. I want to. But that's the nature of New York. Yeah, you know, it wasn't a personal thing. They were just like, "Nice to meet you. Maybe see you again." I don't know. Yeah. But it wasn't like this involved long hangout, and it's like in New York, no one's got time for that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was interesting for me, you know. Um, I'm always early. Yeah. I'm a project manager. No, if no. If I'm I mean, late, everyone else is late. <laughs> it is. And, and, and look, it's, uh, I'm happy to say that I'm, I'm aware of like these things that I've been doing and I've just been on this cru mm. crusade is probably the best word to, mm. to say this holy crusade to 
try and reshape my habits and like yes. you know and and obviously there's always some of it's you know steeped in psychological stuff and trauma mm. and blah 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 of course but i'm like you know yeah cool okay sweet now we know that now let's fix it you know um, but what you said just then is really important because what i find is that the things that i tell people they're not like magical bits of information from the ether mm. that i'm channeling from some fucking other them <laughs> i'm serious though <laughs> yeah. they we often know what we need to do to get where we need to go. We're just afraid. Well, we're actually, the, it's not the thing, it's the block towards the thing. Mm. So just what you just said, it's like, it's actually trauma, self-esteem, self-worth. These are the things that stop us mm. from saying, no, I'm $30 an hour actually, and I'm not working for any less than that or 40 or whatever it is. These are the things that tell us that, yeah, I want to release this maybe music or video or whatever, but maybe it's not good enough and maybe, 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 and we mm. never do it, you know? So, and what you were saying before about setting music, I have a lot of muso clients and they're like, help me finish my tracks. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I can, like we can talk about that. But at the end of the day, it's about, it's, it's all up to them. Mm. So if you were like, oh, Bo, I've got like five, five minute tracks and I want to make them seven minute tracks and I want to release them into an EP or something, you know? Because the other thing is, I would always ask you, what is the point of the music? What are you going to do with it? Because if you don't see an end goal with it, mm. there's not much motivation to finish it. Yeah, yeah. If the only person who's going to hear it is your mate here and your mate there through good speakers go, wow, that sounds sick, man. That's not really a motivator for you. Yeah. yeah. So then I would say, okay, Nawaf, so what else are you doing? You're like, well, I'm, I'm working two days a week. I've got my daughter two days a week and I'm doing podcasts one day a week, which means I've only really got one day a week to mm. spend on my music. I'm like, all right. So how long does it take you to finish a track? Because it's different for everyone. Yeah. There's no point me saying, Nawaf, will you commit to finishing four tracks a week if you can't do that? Why would I do that? Mm. It doesn't mean anything to me if you finish four tracks. So I've actually had a couple of clients in the last couple of years who've been like, I have 12 tracks and I need to release them. And I'm like, okay, what do we fit in? What works? Can you send me the one you finish each week? And then I've, I've set them homework, put a video, a live video online, when you do each track, that's your accountability. Mm. Share it to your networks. Tell them you've done it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some people do actually do the tracks. Mm. Other people do not. Yeah. At the end of the day, I am not responsible for what then they, they then do with what we've agreed on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I've just tried to craft something around what they're telling me, their constraints in their life and their motivations are. Yeah. At the end of the day, the work's up to them. Yeah. yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But, but having a goal that is relevant, like as in I will work for two hours every Sunday on finishing those tracks. Mm. Maybe that's all the time you have. Yeah. You know, but if you do it and you do it for four Sundays in a row, you're like, oh, my God, I'm actually getting somewhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's something I have to go and go back into. It's actually a good idea. It's like when you when you break down yes. the process. and Bite it's like, size. Yeah. I, I actually I had this big issue of even just like, not writing music. Oh, I'm like, oh, I, I can. I'm not great, but I'm like, so I started doing this thing where I write 30 minutes every day. I did it for a while and I was actually like, oh, I got so much better. Mm. And now when I approach writing music, um, I, I have another one of your clients, Sned. Uh, uh, yes. Sned's uh, it's been such He's a... He's one of the ones who asked me to set parameters with him mm. for releasing these tracks that were almost finished. They were all so nearly close. Yeah, yeah. You know, but he is another person. I don't think he'll mind me saying this. He struggles with perfectionism over completionism. Yeah. A lot of creatives do. Yeah. And yeah. and and while that is a, a very humble, noble way to be, usually it is only you that is being that really tough critic. Mm. You know, it's like when a DJ gets off stage and they've just done a banging set and they're like, oh, I totally fucked that up. And you're like, no, you didn't, man. Look at everybody. No one even realized that you dropped that one mix that maybe you noticed and I noticed because I'm a DJ as well. Yeah. Like I do notice when DJs drop mixes. Most people do not. Yeah. You know, and it's them going, oh, I fucked that up. And it's like, you just rocked it, man. Yeah. Like actually look at what you just, you actually just rocked it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm about positive reinforcement because if you tell someone they're shit, guess what they're going to become? Shit. Self you prophecy. tell them how great they are over and over and over. They start they, believing. Yeah. yeah. They start drinking the Kool-Aid. And, and the thing <laughs> is we talk about ego, but to be honest, most people have low self-worth. Yeah. You know, yeah. and most people need an ego boost, not the other way around. Yeah. Ad admittedly, myself, yeah. you know. Um, actually, it's really funny. 
one uh, my wife got me to watch um, a movie with her uh, two day two nights ago called Revolutionary Road. Um, oh, I've heard of it. Yeah, um, it's got Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet in it. Um, oh. The movie itself failed to. Iter- Are they married? In the movie, yeah, 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 yeah I think yeah. I have seen it. it. It failed to iterate the the subtle dynamics of their relationship and why their sort of relationship broke down. But essentially, you know, she read, she just read the book, and that's why she wanted to watch the movie. Mm. And she said to me, "Oh, you know, the book goes so much deeper." And basically, Leonardo, you know, end up his character ends up going into this job where his dad used to work there, and he never really had his dad's respect or like his pride, and so he. Um, you know, essentially end up in that job just so he could earn his dad's approval. But Mm. then his dad died, Mm. you know? And there's a part of me doing construction that I'm like, I just, that moment that she said those words, I was just like, oh, I feel like I've been doing construction a little bit. First it was for, because I enjoyed building festival stages. You know, then it went into, cool, this could be a career path and plus it's going to help me migrate to the country. Mm. Then I got married, you know, and I didn't have to do that anymore. So Mm. I'm like, okay, well now it's kind of like supporting the family. It's good money, Mm. you know? But I'm doing it really because it's the one th- first time in my life that I feel like my dad really approves of this thing, you know, because mm-hmm. he's an architect. And, uh-huh. and, 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 you know, and fair enough, we have great conversations. We've always had good conversations anyways, but it's mm. like, you know, am I really just doing this, you know, for him? Yep. This is where it's at for me. Mm. So, you know, I've got three weeks now and uh, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Um, I'm just going to find a way to make this a more income, you know, based, mm. you know, um, it's going to take a while, but there's other stuff that I can do in the side, mainly like, Hey, I can make furniture, which is going back to that. Oh, I got into this because I enjoyed, you know, being making involved things. in stages and mm. making things. So I'm like, can I make simple things that I can sell online? Mm-hmm. You know, and especially in this COVID times, like what can I Absolutely. do instead of going to a job site and getting yelled at, Yeah, you know? So, yep. uh, it, it's funny. It's like, what you're saying with your business is just tweaking. Yes. Tweaking habits. Oh my God, this is what I'm all about during COVID because yeah. I'm busy. I've got a lot of clients right now yeah. and they're not reinventing themselves. They're pivoting. Mm. They're, we're looking at, okay, so I used to work in a restaurant. That restaurant is no longer open. Suddenly all these chefs, they're doing food deliveries online and it's like the people I know who've done a 180, they're not doing a 360 and changing the wheel. Mm. They are pivoting. And exactly what you just said, I think it's valuable for creatives to understand that you can make things with your hands as well. Mm. You can do this and you can do that. And who cares why you're doing it? You're learning that skill and you know you're good at it now and maybe you can do something else with it. Yeah. But this idea of, of, of I, I rabbit on about it a lot, but diversification, mm. you know, and it's like, it's not about, like so you said, you studied accounting. Uh, but yeah, international business. Okay. It was, it was, a, it was I, I can tell though, yeah. Nawaf, that that is not something that's going to keep Nawaf happy. <laughs> I can tell. I hardly know you. I know what I know of you. Yeah. That doesn't seem like a picture that would keep you happy in mm. your soul. Yeah. It might make money to da 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 da. Eventually, you're going to be like a caged animal. Yeah. In that job, if that's all you did nine to five. Yeah. So I it's, mean, it's just a, a part of me does yeah. feel like it right now. Because I'm not able to, you know, once upon a time, at least when I was in university, I had this, I had time because I didn't really study. Mm. I would just chase gigs mm. and that's all I did. Do you I feel would... like you're time poor now? Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, I'm very time poor. And so when I do have that time, I do, I find out how I can work twice as fast, you yes. know, at home. Like if I'm like, something is like, I come, I do the cooking at home, right? For example, yeah. so I do a seven, eight hour day construction, sometimes even 10. I still come back home and I still cook a meal for the whole family, mm. but I've got to do it fast. Mm. I like cooking. That's another yes. That's another avenue of money making mm. that my friends are like, you should pursue, right? So I'm like, sweet. While I'm not doing that, I'm going to use this time to refine my skill set so that I can cook fast because one mm. day I'm going to open up a restaurant maybe and I've mm. got the speed dialed in. Yes. Uh, you know, and the recipes. I think we need to be careful, though, of money. And people have accused me of this in the past, which is why I'm very aware of it now. Monetizing everything you're good at. Okay. I think we really, really need to retain some things just for joy. Mm. You know, honestly, just for yeah, joy. Yeah, okay, okay. And I would almost encourage you not to look at this podcast as a moneymaker. No, I'm, I'm not. It's definitely... Okay, you it, just gestured at that before when you uh, were like, you know, these creative things, you know. I, I guess um, for me, yeah... 
like it would be nice to have you know the advertisement fees and stuff because for all mm. the hard work that we put in but it's definitely not the focus mm. the focus well, there's is, nothing that says you can't do that yeah but yeah. even with that being a future goal I just wouldn't want it to take any of the the, the point of why you did it out. Mm. And the other way that you might be able to make money, and I don't know if we should, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> You're waxing your lyrical, own. yeah, yeah, <laughs> is after walking in and seeing your setup, maybe the money that is generated is from you renting the space out to other people who want to do podcasts. Yeah, I've definitely thought about that. Or something like that, Nawaf, mm. which is actually hands, Nawaf hands off. Mm. This is where we really make proper money is when we are not, delivering all of the work. When you do construction or stage building, that's you doing the building. Mm. Same as when I'm coaching someone one-on-one, -on -one, it's me doing the, the thing. Yeah. Where, where the, the, the fluidity and the, 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 the scaling happens is when we can take these resources we already have and sell them without having to deliver. Yeah. That's the real entrepreneurship. It there. absolutely is. And it's, I don't know how to do it for reality check. I can't train someone to be me. How do I do that? Yeah. And yeah. this is why I started the agency mm. because I've been getting work for people for 15 years without making any commission. So it's time to, to make the commission. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just paid for my new website redesign through commissions with my web developer, getting everyone else's website online. Yeah. So that $2,000 spend, I didn't have to pay, you know? So I think. There are ways to make money with exactly the the, the medium we're talking about. Mm. It just may not be in the way that we think. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this COVID, post-COVID world we're looking at, totally different. Mm. So much. The game has changed. So much has been lost, but so much is going to grow mm -hmm. as well. People have time to, re again, not necessarily reinvent themselves, but okay, maybe reinvent themselves. Re but also Reassess. Yes. Reassess and tweak and, and change, you know? Absolutely. One thing that um, both me and my um, my missus were like, like this time in lockdown, we're not going to sleep late. We're not going to do this. This time we're going to like. Oh, the second lockdown? The second lockdown, yes. you know, we're like, okay, cool. You know, we had that like nice, you know, I don't know, honeymoon moment of just mm. like staying at home. I mean, I didn't, I haven't stopped since, yeah. you know. The I haven't thing. stopped. Yeah. I've and, just been stuck in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm like so looking forward to this like, break even though there's not going to be any income and i should be stressing mm. about it but i'm not because i'm like because i'm rich in other ways and i'm, I'm excited because i'm like cool i have i'm going to write down the goals mm. and something but a lot of things have to come out of this right if you have all of that and you have three weeks if i was coaching you i'd tell you to write up a calendar okay like literally those 21 days and something to focus on each day. And so if it's like time with my daughter, then that's that day. Mm. And if you can fit anything around that, great. Yeah. But if you've got a free Sunday, it's like what are those things you're not achieving? And to put it in, look at the three weeks as as, as exactly that, your three-week creative mac holiday. Mac macro and micro, like yes. you were saying. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and also I think uh, creatives, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Mm. And sometimes that pressure makes us completely stagnant, like we actually don't do anything. Yeah. Because of all that, like, oh, my God, I'm not, I'm not, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Yeah, I have that a lot, yeah. Yeah, I know, a lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the prescription for that uh, ailment is have a, have a break, have a kick but, but also right? just small chunks. Yeah. But achievable things. By you saying, I need to release an album in six months, you will not make any more of that music. But if you're mm. like, I need to finish that five minutes into a seven minute track or whatever it is. Yeah. Way more achievable. Yeah, there's a great TED talk about um, this guy who, do you think the guy who like, he, um, what's that thing called? Knitting? Mm. Knitting? He's he's like some, um, you know, never had, the, the again, the discipline or, you know, like the focus to stay and do stuff. But then he started approaching his goals in like little sections. Oh, yes. He broke down his, his like things. And before he knew it, he was like knitting entire like giant boulders or like some giant oh, tree that he did amazing so some like great national monument in the ah. states uh, and you know he they allowed him to do it because you know he won the guinness book of world records and it wasn't even like his his mm. thing he's just he's like cool i'll use the he found a formula basically yes you know make the goal make a plan yep instead of making this really massive mm. you know goal that you, that seems unattainable mm. make it more attainable by breaking it down Absolutely. into certain processes and and that's been for me my two years it's like oh it's like a mm. light bulb like your, your reality check yes. logo is a light bulb yes, it you is. Know? i think i think the thing with that though is some of these other coachy people in this sphere um 
they do try a one size fits all. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because not only are we not taking into account the fact that you're Arab and you're going to be late, <laughs> but also the fact that you're a dad mm. and you're married and you do this and you do th- like this. There's 85 other factors actually yeah. Yeah. into just, oh, no, do it like this. It doesn't work that way. And, you know, same with sort of almost everything. And this is why I don't want to standardize what I do. Mm. I do want to meet people fresh every time. Who are you? What are you about? And what do you want to achieve? And try and help them from that place. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm. Amazing. And so you've mentioned this a few times now, the agency. Agency. agency what yeah. is the agency? What is it called? It's called the Real Army. Okay. Um, again, me being cheeky, mm-hmm. I feel like w- in my network, we can do better than the army. <laughs> 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 um, and it's also a bit cheeky because when you Google the real army, only the military comes up, nothing else. So it'll be us and the military, oh, which I kind of like. Um, and plus on the on the social media, I talk a lot about the army. We're the army. We are the army. Yeah. We have enough people in this community network in Melbourne to achieve almost anything I feel. Yeah. And I really believe in not paying some random from the yellow pages. I believe in paying you and paying you and paying your friend and paying if we all pay each other to do what we're great at, we don't need anyone outside. Yeah. So the agency is I started an agency ten years ago, but it was to book hip hop acts. And it's still been going ever since? Mm, I have been managing one band for a long time, uh, Men Imitating Machines. But the hip hop agency fell apart because I left my role booking nightclubs and, uh, you know, it was just a bit of a nightmare really. And that's also Dan's, uh, he was talking about um, High Society, his 12-piece hip-hop band, they were signed to my label. Label, so that's the thread there. Correct. And Mm. we were housemates at the time and all that as well. Um, But anyway, so 10 years ago I started an agency called Ghetto Arts because my middle name is Ghetto. I don't know if you knew that. Really? My middle name on my passport. Bo Ghetto Kitty. Yeah. Are you for real? <laughs> for real, I changed it 20 years ago. That yeah. is the <laughs> shit. So you're a ghetto kitty. A ghetto kitty, yeah. Fuck yes. So ghetto kitty, <laughs> ghetto kitty was my little rebel name when I was doing um, graffiti and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So then I changed my name. Anyway. I call my wife Ghetto Flower. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. So um, I like that. The ghetto and the flower and the kitty. It's like the cute and the mean and the yeah, tough and the, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good. The diamond in the rough. Exactly. Um. So anyway, uh, it, it, honestly, my business has come about because I realize I've been doing something for free for 10 years. Mm. So I encourage anyone, if you've been doing something for free for 10 years, maybe you should monetize it. Yeah. Because that's what I've done and it's yeah. worked out well, you know. Yeah. So the, the Real Army, is a, it's a creative agency, yeah. um, which is why I was talking to your amazing uh, film guy who's helping mm. us film this he's, today. He's inconspicuous, but we're going to look at him. He, he hates it when he looks. No, he's not. Today, today he's Hi. kissing back at us. <laughs> Um, he's going to be on the podcast soon. Yeah, great. He I think be. He's going to be. He's going to be entertaining. Yeah. yeah oh, he is amazing. Yep. Um, he's my Blaney. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. At the moment, I've got graphic designers, web developers, but I've also and photographers, like all of those things, to sort of help people level up their digital presence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But through all of these years, I've actually got everybody. I've got everybody. The other day, we did. Uh, I, I hired uh, an alien nurse model. I hired a photographer and... What, sorry, what is that? Alien nurse? Ali- she was an alien nurse model. She was an H and she turned up to be an alien nurse. I can't say anything more. It's all su- super confidential. Okay. But we're okay. rolling out a new product. Area 51. That shit. is alien based. Okay. An alien based product. And so the, the these are my clients, the toy makers. Okay. And then, so I had to come up with an alien nurse and I had to come up with a photographer and we did a photo shoot and... We got the sort of, and then my graphic designer did the document that we needed. So it was all my team pulling together this sort of beginning of something, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, so that's what the agency is, basically. It's literally a referral agency yeah. for awesome creatives who are really good at what they do and really reasonably priced. Um, and, and yeah, I make commission on the bookings basically. Yeah. And do you manage the actual financials of everyone getting paid or how did no. you structure that? No, because I don't there's want... an art to that as well. There is, but we have to be very careful in Australia with all the red tape and bureaucracy that we are faced with. When you go to start a labor hire company, which is where you say your hourly rate is $40, I'd go, sure, Nawaf, I'll pay you 40, but I'm going to charge you out at 120. Yeah. That has happened to me way too much in my life and I think that is unethical. Yeah. I am not down with that. 
Mm. It's happened to me a lot. I've been paid $30 an hour for an office job and they were charging me out at 120. 120. Yeah. And you're they like, were just making that money. You're like, give me 70. No, what? <laughs> no way. I'm not yeah. down with that anymore. Mm. So this is where. It happens a lot in construction, by the way. It happens in every industry. Yeah. Literally every industry. This whole agent thing, it's actually just a way to exploit workers often, I feel. And yeah. I don't want to do that. Um, so my commission, so if you came to me to sign up with the agency, you might be like, well, I do construction and I do podcasts and I also, uh, I'm a painter, but I don't want to, I don't need more work painting. I don't want to be represented for that. And I'm like, okay, great. What are your rates for those? And you go, well, $30 an hour, $60 an hour. And I go, great. So then I'm going to hire you out at those rates mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell the client that it's 20% on top for me. Yeah. And then I get paid and you get paid. Um, but what's good about that is it's transparency. Absolutely. Mm. It's transparent. And this is one thing I have managed to achieve over all these years is I've got, I've gotten, uh, hopefully anyway, I, I don't mess people around with, with stuff like that. I don't mess people around with money. Mm. I don't do that, you know, and that's yeah. part of the straight shooter thing, you know? So if I'm going to do something like that, it's going to be transparent and everybody's going to know what the, what the parameters are. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. But anyway, I, I announced it on Facebook in 2019 and then I was about to roll it out at the start of this year and then COVID happened. So it's still ticking along, still getting jobs, but I haven't made the website or anything yet. Yeah. 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 But again, you've got the team, so it's not, it's well, not I've long. It's I've not signed long. 30 creatives yeah. to my books. Um, yeah. So that's a start. And then have they been, those 30 creatives, have they, has work already been coming to them? Have you yeah. been giving them, you know, sort of consistent work? Some of them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the ones who are in demand at the moment, which, as I said, are all the digital peep team. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a question. Um, obviously, uh, we talk we talked about um, you know festival people trying to vet you to you know to see your work and what's what's that. Mm -hmm. But now that you're doing a reality check, um, how would you like? Right now, we've got a bunch of viewers, right? I'm, I'm like, I'm giving you the floor to <laughs> to sell yourself in, oh, in, in, okay. in a sense, or or just like. Why they should go? Why why should they seek Bob? I mean, mm. I know why, and I will. Mm, mm, um, mm. But if you had the chance to do that, what, what would you say? I think I would say that um, I'm obviously a pretty unique person, and this is a pretty unique form of of, of coaching. I don't actually like the word coaching, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, that is what I do, and that is what I've had to adopt. You know. Yeah. I also feel a slightly high. I get hives when people say life coach. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but unfortunately that is what I do as well because we talk about all the other things that are going on Yeah. so if someone you know tells me that they're drinking at 4 o'clock every day and they're not achieving anything and they feel terrible then we might talk about how they're sleeping what they're eating and all of that now I'm not a nutritionist but I've done enough work on myself and with other people that I feel you know um, reasonably qualified enough to set parameters with people that can help in other areas than just business, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, the other thing is that people think that I only work with creatives and I don't at all. I do actually work with some accountants about how to get better clients, more clients. Yes, how to level up. Mm. Um, and, you know, the phrase level up is very Gary V and da da da. I'm like, level up, level, level up, up, level up. And I'm a bit American like that, you know, but it's like. I love it. I just really feel like, you know, as well in Australia, we, we, we generally are pretty complacent here. How so? Well, we have the conservative government yep. who yep. looks after us all and mostly. Yeah. I mean, most people are not living in daily poverty here. Yep. Most people have some, some sort of network and some sort of whatever. Um, and we are very abundant here. Mm. We're very, we have high hourly wages. We have heaps of resources. We have great food. That allows us to be somewhat complacent. So we don't for, pursue our dreams. Sometimes. Mm. Some people I, I know, a lot of people I know, I love you all dearly, but some people make stuff, amazing stuff, and then they sit in their lounge room and wait for someone to find them. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, no one's knocking on your door. Yeah. You have to knock. Yeah. Take this thing, this awesome thing, and do something with it. Put it somewhere. Send it to people. I mean, to some people, the idea of emailing or, or sending a, an actual package to their biggest idols mm. in whatever industry is terrifying. But that's how you do things. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know? Gary Vee talks about this a lot. Yeah, so I really encourage people to do things in the world. Some people are like, oh, digital marketing, SEO. I'm like, do you even know what SEO means? Mm -hmm. Unless you have $10,000 to waste on SEO, you're not even in the ring. And a lot of people don't want to hear that, Nawaf. Yeah. But the truth is, don't waste your money. Yeah. You know, and do a million other things first. You know, I had a client email me the other day about SEO and I... I told him that. And then I said, have you done this, this, and this on Google? And he's like, no, I'm going to go do that. And it's like, sure, I just gave him some free advice, but hopefully he, you know, he'll call me up when he needs some more help or whatever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm. And that's important as well. You got to, you know, you got to have the, I don't want to say use a fish, a fishing analogy, but you know, you got to give them the bait first. You do. You, you have to give. And this is where when people first message me, I do give them a little something, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm also a little bit intuitive and empathic and I I feel things about people mm. that are often quite and, – and part of that is like uh, body language and stuff. Like some people, you'll ask them a question and they'll be going, yes, yes, Bo. And I'm like, mm. or I'll, I'll, I'll say, have you ever – I'll say, have you ever thought about this? And all they offer up for the next 10 minutes is can'ts, won'ts, and don'ts. That's what I call them. Mm which is just excuses really. Yeah. But it's like, why all the excuses? Like, I don't, I don't need to hear them, but why, why all the can'ts, won'ts and don'ts coming out in here? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I've definitely been that person. We all have. We all have. We all have. And yeah. The hardest thing for me is that when I do this work, I must take my own advice. Mm. So I haven't been able to be complacent. I haven't been able, I mean, I am for short times, yeah. but then it's like, I have to turn the reality check lens on my own self and my own business. And recently, one of the things I realized was that the word ghetto needs to be phased out of my business persona. It does. I'm, I'm, I'm a business coach. And yeah. as much as I'm from the trippy whatever communities, my name is already Bo Kitty. It's already weird. Yeah. I'm already heavily tattooed with a slight American accent. Like there's a few barriers there already yeah. to the regular person, you know, and so... Dropping the ghetto has meant thousands of dollars, actually, of changing Google and Google Suite and moving all everything to another server and changing this website and that. And, like, we're talking 20 years of branding. I've had to pivot yeah. now, you know. Um, but the fact that you didn't know that my name was ghetto means it's working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's great. Yes. I mean, is Kitty your surname? Yes. That's legit your surname. Legit, it surname. wasn't always, right? No, I changed it. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I changed it's it 20 years ago. We were all changing our names. Teriyaki and Naki. Teriyaki, everybody changed their names. It, how easy was it to just change your name? 40 bucks. Really? Births, deaths, and marriages. One form and 40 bucks. Yep. Now there's a lot more hoops. In I don't actually know if there is. Really? I don't know. I haven't done it in 20 years. Mm. Huh. But I used to keep the forms in my bookshelf because a lot of people carry a lot of residual anger, shame, guilt around names they were born into that they don't resonate with. Yeah. And I'm like, why carry that around then? You can be like Nawaf Powerpuff if you want. Why not? <laughs> I'll change my name to Waffles. More, more, sure. More, I mean, more than... <laughs> I have a friend who is Maximilian 18 Carat. That's his name. Wow. I had another friend, dearly departed, named Jason Darling. My dear friend in Tassie changed her name to Gushy Soda. <laughs> and she has kids now named Charlie Radio Soda. Charlie and... Radio. Aurora Sublime Soda. Oh, my God. So, yeah, there was a big phase in the in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s where a lot of people changed their names. Yeah, re reinventing ourselves. I was going to say lo lots of acid. <laughs> no, it was honestly just like it was distancing ourselves from the normal world, from the real world. Yeah. We all had shaved head with colorful bits and new names and we were living it. And I think mm -hmm. that's the difference with the scene now, to go back to what we were talking about before, is... For I see these ads pop up on Facebook and and I don't know if you've ever been to Burning Man, but I felt felt the same about Burning Man. A lot of people, they're accountants. And then one week a year, they go to Rainbow or they go to Burning Man. And it's like, nah, man, we lived it. Yeah. That was our whole life, our whole identity. That's our ethos, our, our way. Absolutely, of our way of That's... moving through the world. But the DIYness and all the rest of it, everything that came with it. You know, and so now I sort of feel like it's become a little bit of a, a leisure activity. A novelty thing, you know. It's like, yeah. oh, wow, yeah. yeah. It, it's definitely the, the thing that's made it, for me, like lose a bit of its Same. A, appeal. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, and why I 
prefer at I still prefer to be at the festivals, but my favorite time at a festival is at the very end of it. Mm. That's when all of all of the like close knit crews we're gonna go and we're gonna create the renegade. Mm. We're gonna like you know. Sned's gonna bring his car batteries, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm gonna pull up my laptop, and I'm like, I would bring my own mixer to the festivals because I'm like, I'm I'm sitting in the shadows, waiting, waiting, <laughs> yes. um, uh, evil Lord Waffles, uh, just yeah. re- ready. But you know, it, like I'll give you an example. Um, at ESO, uh, the Hammock Temple, which is where I was um, mm. helping, at least two two nights in a row, um, it was like a you know there was live music there, but that. Like there was cool, like a funk band called I think the Snake Snakefish Collective or something oh, like yeah. that. It was an amazing like. I love experience. those guys. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. and I, I'd never met him, but I got a chance to like rap with one of the guys, awesome. and, and we you know were jamming, and the whole place was like heaving. Amazing. It was like a house party, mm. and for me, it's like that's what I'm talking about. That's mm. that that moment in time where everything is frozen and and you know, mm. I feel like as event promoters or organizers, it's like that's what you should be chasing. Do you know what I mean? Can you create that vibe on every single yes. you know stage? Can you create that? My new- moment at Esoteric, because I'm not an MC, so I don't get that musical moment, right, mm. where I'm on stage and I'm like, whoa, it's all happening. Yeah. I don't but, have that. But even as a punter, you, you do, you know, you still you, like. Yeah, if but so- I mean as, a, as an organizer, yeah, 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 yeah. that moment of, oh, we just created a house party, that's not my moment. But my mm. moment at ESO this year the- was the opening ceremony. I went down to have a look. I got up on the bleachers at the back of a house sort of thing mm-hmm. and and it was when the ceremony finished and the dance floor began. That was my moment. I was like, fuck yeah. Like the energy, mm. the number of people, everyone was like at the start of the party, like all sparkly and like, woohoo, we're yeah, here, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We made was, it. Yeah, that was my moment, you mm. know. And then I'm like, yep, saw it, back to the office. <laughs> yeah. I know that feeling. It's like, yeah. wow. We've been building up on uh, this right? thing. We've been working towards yes. it, and now in the rain and in the mud and yeah, in the dirt, yeah, yeah, dealing with this person yeah. and, uh, and yeah. you know the dramas, and then it's like all that. Just it falls like, away for a minute. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And then, all right. And I actually had another moment when uh, Dan uh, went on stage to do his his track that he'd been workshopping with me privately mm-hmm. and then suddenly I'm at ESO, I'm at Snake Pit, they're all my old friends from the drum and bass scene and my buddy who's like, he's like a brother to me, Dan, in a way, mm-hmm. he's on stage with an adoring crowd. Like that was another moment where I was just like, fuck yeah, like this is yeah. awesome, you know. Yeah. Um, but I get off on seeing him shine. Yeah, Like I get off on, on seeing the people I know up there shining. I mean, yeah, I love yeah. that, you know. Yeah, mm. yeah. I have a very similar um, experience with um, – my, my good friend Oscar. Um, oh, yeah. No, other oh, sorry. Oscar. Uh, Grouch. Oh, yes, Grouch. Um, yeah. I was really involved when the last Grouch and Dub album sort of uh, came came together mm. a, as well as like helping putting the band. I managed him for a short period of time. Didn't do a, a great job. I was trying to do four or five different things yeah. for money, um, in, including like just having a kid. Yeah. And so I, I dropped the ball a lot in that, you know, I – confused dates and this and that, you know, um, just, uh, you know, just drop the ball. Yep. But there were some cool shit that, that, came, that came out of that, you mm. know, two two years or whatever of working together. You know, we created mm. a lot of good events, but the moment when the album was finished and we, I think we did a show with, oh, was it at Rubik's? We did a bunch of like album launch parties that mm. were sold out, like packed to the thing and, you know, him playing at the band, with the band and like six piece band and everything and everything sounding tight you know me in the background yeah. being a maniac going the decor has to be this the projection mapping has to be this you know um and it was like that's my boy yep that's my boy yep you know and yep. all of all of his friends as well all of melbourne like the diehard grouch grouch fans you know there to see wait for this album that you know mm. that they've been you know when a grouch and grouch album comes out everyone's yes. like because you know it's I love gonna, Grouch's music. Yeah, as well. it's different. It's right up my alley though. Yeah. Like it makes me want to swing my butt to it, you know. And yeah, like a yeah. lot of electronic music these days, it's no. it's all up here. It's all to- I don't know. It doesn't doesn't his, have his that. His encompasses everything. Mm. You know, it's it's the it's the whole shebang. Yeah. Uh, and and I know it because it's like he listens to so much different kinds of music and he, mm. he slips like he does like from a producer standpoint. I'm always like, man, you just slipped that in there, Slip didn't you? Stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah cheeky. Like, yeah, yeah, you're a bit cheeky. And that's his personality type. Mm. Um, but, yeah, there's there's been a lot of moments where I've, you know, I, c- I can relate to that. Mm. Really happy for your friends, especially when they've like, it's such a, it's like a career-defining moment yes. for them. And 
you were there. Yes. To see that. I, I have to share with you, I've got two career defining moments to share with you. Mm. One for me was in nightclub world and one was in festival world. Yeah. The nightclub one was probably, I don't know, 2009 or something. When I was booking Miss Libertine, do you know Miss Libertine? I used to live, um, Frank. What is it? What the street called? Frank. Um, Franklin. Franklin Street. So just around the corner, the first okay. place I ever lived in Melbourne was on oh, Swanston really? Street strip in that big high-rise building. Oh. As, 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 as a, I hated it, but yes, yes. But Miss Libertine was just around the corner, and I yep. used to yeah, I used to go there. So we used to run a Wednesday hip hop night, which was cheap jugs and, and DJs. And then we had live hip hop bands in the back room. And mm. then I ran an art gallery upstairs where we'd have um, art openings. So we had a bit of a thing going on on Wednesdays that was kind of hip hop related. But anyway, um, one night someone at the club got a call and uh, basically it was like 2 p.m. And they were like, hey, Bo, we might have De La Soul come down and play a little guest set for free tonight. What do you reckon about getting a crap? Like, do you reckon you can mobilize and you know and I was like it's two o'clock yeah start now and they're like no we don't know yet and I was like oh mate it's cutting it fine but all right let me know when you know like l yeah. let me know as soon as you know when they give him an answer kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. five o'clock we were given the yes right and 2009 so social media wasn't super the place yet right yeah yeah but you could send a lot of invites right so I ended no up putting a post up going deal us all free five dollar jugs tonight at Miss Libs, at five o'clock I put that post up. I went home, got changed, went back to the city in my best hip hop gear, br br br, whatever. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, meeting my idols, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. And um, I got there at nine o'clock. We were at capacity 600 people. We had people spilling outside, but it was all my favorite people in the whole city. Yeah. All in the one room. Yeah. That I pulled together in four hours, yeah, you know? Yeah. And they played this amazing set and they got me on stage and da 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 but They got you on stage. Yeah. What totally. did they do? Like, oh just Bo Kitty, blah blah blah, whatever. And I was like, oh my god. Like she made it happen kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah Even yeah. though I didn't really, I was just the booker there, but I was like looking after them and bringing them drinks and you know what I mean, doing the host yeah. thing. But it was just the fact that all those people had mobilized in four hours and I was like, see Melbourne, we might be fickle, but something good happens and everyone's there, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that was my pinnacle in, in club land. And in uh, in festivals, it actually was uh, the, the last Maitreya that went ahead 2015. That party was insane. We thought we were going to have 5,000 people and we had 10. And I pulled it off. We pulled it off. You know, but I was running ops and I did not, I didn't even sleep. I don't know what happened. But at the end, of, I remember this, at the end of my shift on the last day, Monday or whatever, walking in thongs, because obviously I'd been in boots for seven days or whatever, in thongs with an espresso martini to the dance floor. And everyone just giving me massive props at what we just did, like the crew. And that was another moment where I was like, I can't believe that we did that. Yeah. yeah but that yeah. was amazing what the fuck just happened you know yeah, yeah, yeah. um and yeah nothing's actually come close to those two moments hasn't no. actually come close any party ever yeah you know i've had like beautiful experiences uh, at rainbow serpent but they haven't been working mm. no nah, they've been they've been with my crew there you know it's different yeah so it, that is a factor it's when it's not just recognition from any random person, but it's when you're closest, you know, your family's around you. And that's, Absolutely. that's where you're just like, hey, I see you. Yeah. I see what you've done. I mean, recognition from total strangers is really amazing because you don't yeah. even know that they notice you. Yeah. But recognition from people you respect, nothing, nothing is better. Yeah. yeah. You know? That's definitely like, um, you know, uh, I, I've brushed upon this like, uh, who would make money on that? But... The thing that I've learned is I'd rather market myself to a thousand people, right? Mm -hmm. That care, and it's a, it's it's the same thing. Then ten thousand who don't. Th then ten thousand who yes. don't, and it's it's the same thing. It's like uh, like even everything that you've shared with me today, there's at least three or four people in my close network of friends um, who I'm just like they need to listen to this podcast, mm. and then I'm gonna be like, look. Um, you're earning money now, more money than you've ever been earning in a long time. This is a, for a really good friend of mine. I hope she's watching this. And I'm going to be like, watch this and then hit this woman up mm. because she's what you need. Well, this is what's so interesting is I've been doing reality check for seven years. Mm. And it has, it's, it's blowing me away. The, the clients who are coming to me now, the, I don't know how they're finding me. They're mm. not through that. Okay. But what's so interesting is that everybody knows someone who they know needs to meet me. 
Mm. And it's not actually because they're not doing anything or achieving anything or whatever. It's because they know that they need that kick that I could provide. Yeah. That encouragement, but also butt kick, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's what I love is that I'm not for everyone, but I'm definitely for some people, for you someone. know? Yeah, 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 for, yeah. For quite a few, for a chunk of the population, they really resonate with me, who I am and what I, how I do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said about the bowl cupping, don't come to me if you just want me to go, oh, yeah, you're doing great. Like that's that's not what I'm about, you know. Yeah. Speaking of, I actually bought you a present. Ooh! I bought you this deck of cards, which was one of my ventures, um, and it's a little motivator for you to be a completionist, not a perfectionist. Okay. Because oh. I, I backed myself to the tune of 10 grand to print those. Reality check, yes. They, the they, power. Cost, they cost you 10, 10 grand, cost you 10 grand. They cost me ten thousand dollars. Yes, wow. ten thousand dollars to design and print. And how have you seen your return on investment? Just out of mm, curiosity. Uh, look, I probably made that ten grand back in fifty dollar increments over the last five years. Okay, yeah. Uh, but they've served their purpose well. What they? They look I, beautiful. Though. They're thank you. They're a beautiful product, and they're all Aussie made and stuff. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is I thought they were going to be like my residual income, like as in I was like, oh, I've made a product, and that's going to keep me ticking along. Da 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 da. Um, but they're very niche. They are tarot for business. Yeah, yeah. I no was, one gets it. You, you hinted at that. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, the people who get it are the people that, that understand holistic business coaching. Um, but I tried to get them in a lot of stores and like they got in readings, for example, in Ligon Street. Yep. And then when I went in to look at them, they'd put them in the drinking games. Yeah. And I was like, this is not, they're not a drinking game. Like. I think they How just, would this be a drinking game? I don't think they even looked at the product. And this is where I got a bit disillusioned going to retailers. Mm. Some of the retailers would be like, yeah, we'll take 100 decks. But then by the time I put them in the shop, I'd make $1 per deck, $100. And I was like, that's a lot of work for yeah. $100. For $100, you, know? you need to find a way to... to yeah. Someone, I, I don't know who I heard, someone once said, you know, with things like this, don't give, don't give anyone a cut of it. No. Do you know what I mean? Don't give anyone a cut, but also really consider whether you want to do wholesale because you're only going to make 50%, which is a dollar. Yeah. So. But these, again, like these are great. I'd love to see them, you know, on a shelf, but same. only find no, only find no for a fact that the person, you know, like yourself who, who's made it is, um, is going to be making something out of mm. it. But I think also because the logo looks a little bit sort of rockabilly and tattoo, people just don't quite get my brand because I'd go into some bookshops and they're like, well, are they self-help? And I'm like, mm, not really. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so it's been an interesting thing. But I think the other reason I wanted to bring the cards, I want you to have them as well. Th thank you, by the way. No problem. But I also thought that um, they're a good um, intro to getting a friend to come see me. Mm -hmm. As in, here's a thing she made. Have a look. Yeah. And then sometimes the people are like, oh, I love everything that's in that. Um, but the other thing is, uh, I know that Dan, uh, when he came on your podcast, he was talking about crowdfunding his, um, video clip yeah. that just got released last week, which came out great with great, James yeah. from Jurassic and all that. Yeah. And I want to talk about crowdfunding really briefly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was, there was talk that I should crowdfund these cards and True that. I think we've lost the point of crowdfunding a little bit. Everyone's trying to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when Dan rang me up and was like, oh, I want to do a crowdfunder for this video clip, I, I, he, I hope he won't mind me telling you this, but he was basically just saying that he was he was going really deep on it and he was going to do a Kickstarter and he was going to have all these tiers, all these things. He was going to offer all these things, all this, this and vinyl and all this shit. And I was like, Dan, aren't you about to have a baby? Aren't you busy? And he's like, yeah, I'm busy. I'm like, so what the fuck, man? Just ask for the money. It's like, oh, I feel really bad. Like, I should have to give, give people something. I'm like, yeah, you're giving them the opportunity to support you and be a part of this film clip. Mm -hmm. And so he put the crowdfunder online. It was funded in 24 hours. 24 hours. Because he asked his community for help. Mm. You know, and the only thing was he didn't need heaps of money. It wasn't 10 grand he was asking for. Yeah. But I'm really glad that I backed my – and I went through the same thing with the cards. It was like, do I crowdfund them, you know, and then it was like, just back yourself. You're a business coach. Don't yeah. crowdfund it. Just back yourself. Just spend the money. Yeah. You know? And I realized that now in hindsight, I just spent 10 grand on really nice business cards, basically. Yeah. But they're very authentic. And, they, and they are. 
they're not like unlike business cards where you have them and they either sit in your pocket for ages or you just sort of cool put it in your phone, you know. Like I mean, some people send me photos of the cards they pull almost weekly still. Yeah. Years oh, later. what I'm, you know, like I'm saying is like this is this is way much better than yes, uh, you know, this is so much better. Sorry, than uh, than just a card that you know you could have just shared a contact, a phone contact, yep. or I could, you know what I mean. For me, this is something that I'm actually like, because I saw this on your website on oh, yes, you? yesterday, right? And I'm like, sick. I was like, they're pretty affordable, mm. and they would look nice if they were scattered on my white wall. Yes, as a reminder, and, yes, and because I'm not going to keep this anywhere within a two year old's reachable thing, right? <laughs> she, my my ATM cards are already trashed. As oh no, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what yeah. does she do to your ATM card? Uh, if, uh, I can't put my wallet uh, anywhere, like you know, in within her height or proximity of reach. Okay. Uh, I have to like, you know. It, I would have to look under the bed for where's yeah. that Commonwealth cut, where's that thing, where's my upcut, where's my driver's yeah, license. Right. It's all over the house. And yeah. I'm just like, I have to consolidate everything because I'm like, I have to work tomorrow. Yes. I need my wallet. I can't, you know? Yep. So I've, I've, you know, I've put it up in the top and I've like put all yeah, my good. cards on my phone. So yeah, it doesn't, good, it doesn't good, happen. Good. <laughs> but um, these are these are amazing. And I they will – I was looking at them literally yesterday going, yeah, they, they was, these would look cool. Um. Like I feel like everyone needs to have an inspiration board. Mm, uh, I have one. You have one. I do. I put random things up there from other people, and I move things around, and yeah. Yeah, it's something that I. I been... put financial goals up there as well. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thing that I, uh, about the cards that's interesting is I was looking at collaborating with artists, and I was gonna. There's 50 cards. I was gonna have 50 artists featured on the cards. Wow. So I approached 10 artists to see what the vibe was and was like, hey, how would you feel if I, you know, use this piece of artwork and put some words over it, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, eight of the 10 artists were like, yeah, no problem, whatever. And two of them really held me to task and were like, well, what's my commission and how many sales and where are you selling them? And I was like, I don't even know yet. Like, I don't even know. I'm just making this thing. Mm -hmm. And that process made me realize that actually I wanted total creative control. Mm. You know, I, just like you said, you're the master of this domain. You get to choose the, the plants and the lighting and how it works and what you ask and da, da 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 And same with that. I got to this point where I was like, I'm actually, I just want to own all of it. I want it to be me. And I ended up using my own photos for all of the cards. And it's so good sometimes, like, to know when to collaborate. Like, collaborations are really powerful and important, but they can also really dilute. And they can really muddy the waters, especially in business, mm -hmm. you know, and we've seen a bunch of this happen with the festival community that we know. Some partnerships, they're amazing and they go and do creative, beautiful things together. And other times, poof, the whole friendship's over. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's important for people to know when to just ask, when to collaborate and when to just go, go there. Yeah. Just back yourself and go there, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, um. Uh, I, I had like two different train of, trainers of thought <laughs> that you wanted me first of all the uh, partnership mm. I just wanted to mention one of the best partnerships that I've ever seen in, in our festival scene is the Strawberry Fields um, crew mm. uh, Elliot, Tara and um, Billy I don't, do you know them? I know them a bit I haven't actually worked there um, but I know them from around you know first first festival for me but um, within this, like the second year I was playing there and then mm. the year after I was like involved like just just lacking around everywhere helping yep. wherever I could and I love those guys because they've you know after all these years they've managed to grow financially and like they've got their business sorted mm. really well but they still have a level of authenticity in, in what mm. they do they're not trying to be the side trans a doof they're not trying yes. to be a do you know they've gotten great live music jazz like mm. all, like they've they're supporting arts in a sense and it has definitely has maybe a glitzy commercial feel to it, but I know them as individuals. Mm. Like, they just, you know, they put on a good production and most of the people that have worked for them and have done decor have said, you know, nothing but great things yes. about how they treat. That's how you know. <laughs> that, and that's how you know. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that's the kind of um, people in that position are people, you know, mm. they're, they're leaders as well. And yes. it's good to see that. But it's sad to see other um, other people, you know, the other partnerships and collaborations break break off. Mm. Uh, I forgot the other train of thought that That's I was right. going to say, but <laughs> what, one thing I wanted to bring up is like I've sort of deciphered your logo. Oh, here we go. Yeah, do you want to hear it? Yes, I do want to hear it. <laughs> First off, definitely a light bulb. It's an aha moment. It's mm -hmm. an it's an epiphany moment, right? Yes. Um, 
and you can see the sparks you can see the 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 electricity um mm -hmm. so you know that that something's rising something's you know a surge is coming but then you've got two other logos where you've got you know it's something that comes from the heart this idea this thing that you're going to do it doesn't it comes from a place of um you know a place that is genuine and authentic but then there's a dollar sign there mm -hmm. so it's like hey yeah, this like million dollar idea that's authentic, it's genuine, it's from the heart. Let's make money let's, with it. Let's make money with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Is that is that it? I mean that's you know <laughs> Look, really it's about you know, not all of us can do what we love for money. Like that's a really romantic notion that I feel is mm. a little bit toxic. Okay. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, we need balance, you mm. know, like so some people are perfectly happy having a nine to five job, doing their accounting or whatever they're doing. And and that's fine, you know. Yeah. But if we can do more of what we love for money, if we can do more, do you know what I mean? Like if we can tie, mm. I feel like this whole idea of, like it's quite a quite an old uh, concept, the idea of what do you do? So what do you do, Nawaf? And it's like, what yeah. do I do? <laughs> what, what do I do for money? What do I do right yeah. now? My dad asks people, I introduce to him all the time. I don't like, what do you do? Yeah. I don't like it. I do everything. What are you into? Totally different question. Mm. You know, but I think that uh, we're getting to this place where, I mean, even in the last, since COVID, the whole gig economy thing has fallen over because all yeah. these people with casual and whatever, whatever, they've fallen through the cracks, mm. you know? And so I think, whereas the people that I know that have five streams of income that are totally freaking different, they're doing all right because this one's died and this one's died, but these two are taking off, mm. you know? And so... It's just about looking at how we marry those things together. Yeah. I mean, I want what we do as work to be part of life. I don't want to work to live. Mm. Why do we want to do that? I want to live, you know. Sorry, I don't want to live to work. Do you know what I mean? I want work to literally just be a means to get the money to do the things we want to do in life. Yeah. And yet some people, that the whole identity is what they do for a job that they don't even really like. Yeah. You know, one of my friends, love him dearly, he's worked in a bank for all this time, he's been a raver. He's worked in a bank. <laughs> he worked in a bank, worked in a bank, worked in a bank. He's just, he said the thing. He's a wife, he had two kids, and uh, worked in a bank. I saw him the other day. He's like, Bob, quit my job. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, what are you doing now? He's like, I'm starting a surfboard website sales portal something. I was like, fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, why are you doing that? He's like, I just, I'm just over it. I haven't been fulfilled lately. And then I was like, you know what? I almost feel like giving up sometimes, you know, because it's hard and you're just a freelance and yeah, and he's yeah, like, yeah. Bo, that's when you don't give up. That's when you don't. And I was like, oh. that's when you dig deep. Yeah. And he, I was like, he's right. This is when I don't give up at seven years when things are still, uh, you know, still rolling. Mm -hmm. Don't give up now. Yeah. 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 Can you say that you're at a position now that, you know, do you worry about money? Do you worry about that sort of financial instability? Or no, you've managed to get to a place where now you do have financial, you've cultivated a place of financial safety by means of doing the thing that you love. Um, mostly yes. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Every now and again. You know, a couple of times a year I freak out and yeah. usually it's after the season ends and it's like April and I'm like, there's no work ever. Yeah. And then it's around September when the bookings haven't come in yet for summer where I'm like, there's no work ever. And that's when I freak out. But what this last six months has shown me is I haven't worked a single event. There has been no events and I am doing fine. Mm. And so it's like, wow, all these other pursuits of mine, the agency, reality check, they are sustaining me. Yeah. You know, and... They've allowed me to sustain myself very well during a time when not everybody else is. And even just that has made me go, wow, this living outside the regular system thing is going to be all right. Mm, I'm going to yeah. be all right, you know. Um, but also I, I, I live within my means. I, I really do. I always have. I was homeless on the streets at 16. So I've never really lived outside my means. I've never racked up huge credit card debts. Uh, survival has been really important to me yeah rent comes first having a house comes first it just has yeah you know i've had partners before who literally want to spend all of our money on drugs <laughs> and i'm like i'm not doing that yeah you know um so i think it's about um it's about really looking at what earning abilities you do have as well because the other thing is for 20 years i've been in the arts there's no money to be made in the arts not really I mean, you're lucky if you're making 50 grand a year. Lucky. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and so I think people have to be realistic about where what industry they're in when they hit the glass ceiling. You know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's amazing advice. You've you've shared so many like bombs of wisdom. Oh. <laughs> and look, first sound bites. Uh, sound bites. <laughs> sound bites. Um, it's going to be a very busy three weeks chopping up video clips and using yes, you know these awesome. little segments of truth and wisdom. Um, yes. First off, uh, to wrap things up. Thank you so much for gift that I was going to buy yesterday. When oh, I was, like, I was, no ch I was checking you out, girl. Yeah, I was good, like, good, man, good. I was like, I liked, I liked. Uh, what I liked was that they were uh, first off, they were like affordable options. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm, I I want to, you know, mm. have a taste there first. Yes. And then, you know, not that I need convincing, but I'm just mm. like, just the fact that you had it there. I'm like, yeah, I, full support. You know, yes. and, and you've made it affordable and accessible. And that's one of the things that I'm I'm really like liking the things that are coming from you is because first off, I think you're a beacon of light, Aww. which is another, you know, <laughs> all us creatives, business, whatever, people in general um, in their 30s and 40s, I think we need mentors. You know, I've been craving mentors yes. for this period of my life, especially post, you know, um, Drug it, drug and taking, you know. Yeah, when you get over that, you're like, right, you how know, do I, I level? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do, I still love, I still love to do that <laughs> yes. shit, but I'm like, you know, it's not, it's, it's not the main focus of my life. So mm. now I want med mentorship and I've learned so much on this journey and I want to do it. So, um, thank you for being, you know, that person to other people. And you're thank you, welcome. thank you for being on the show. Uh, you have your own podcast. I do have my own podcast. I'm not as uh, committed and dedicated as you are <laughs> yep. to putting out regular content, but I do have my own podcast and I would like to interview you on it. Thank you. I'm yes. um, whenever you want to do it. Yes. Um, and yeah, time and place. Yes. Uh, it's called Reality Check as well. It's called uh, Reality Check Yourself because there's a million podcasts out there called Reality Check. So yeah. it's Reality Check Yourself. <laughs> little nod to uh, Ice Cube there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Check yourself before you wreck yep, yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to like, continue on the whole verse, but um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for taking your time. Thank and you for having me. Uh, it's been really fun. Anything you want to share with anyone out there? If it's your body of work or anything that's up up and coming? Not particularly. Um, my other website is me is, is bowkitty .com If you want to see the other stuff I've done, but my main message to everyone right now is is stay hungry. Stay hungry. Stay hungry. Like there is a lot that can happen if you're hungry and if you're, if you're not, then not much happens. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Fuck yeah. No, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And, uh, on the topic of hunger. Lunchtime. Uh, I think it's time <laughs> to break my fast. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Uh, this is Surreal Melbourne episode four, five. Jeez. Anyways, episode four over and out. <laughs> <laughs> See you. I should know, right? <laughs>